Welcome to Empathic Saturday and our second in a series of Empathy Summits produced by the Empathy Center. Today's summit is a two-part series with speakers today and next Saturday. And the topic for this two-part series is empathy, a review of empathy training programs from around the world. So we'll be listening today and next Saturday to empathy trainers who are, will be introducing the work they're doing. And today's summit is being recorded. I'm Kathy Kidd. I'm a volunteer with this Empathy Center, and I'm an Empathy Circle trainer with the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And it's my pleasure to introduce Edwin Rush, whose idea it is to produce this series of Empathy Summits. Edwin is the founder for the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy to foster and promote the value and experience of empathy. Edwin is a focal point in the empathy movement and has been working for decades to build a movement to support a global culture of empathy. And if you come to some of our empathy circles, you'll see people attending from all over the world. And today you'll see people from all over the world, including trainers from uh, empathy, uh, speakers from around the world. Edwin and his brother, Charles Rush, are establishing an, em establishing an empathy-based educational retreat center in Santa Barbara, California. And a major aspect of the retreat center will be working to bridge personal, social, and political divides through the use of mutual listening, empathy, constructive dialogue, and education. And Edwin was also a candidate in the Dem Democratic primary for California's 8th Congressional District, and he was running an empathy campaign, and that was last year. So Edwin, uh, my pleasure to turn the program over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathy. So uh, these empathy summits are uh, to explore all facets of the uh, level, to raise the level of empathy in society. And we're really wanting to build a movement here. It's like more than just individual empathy. It's about how do we create a, a movement in society to raise the overall level of empathy and it really warms my heart to uh, be here. It's a little anxiety producing with all these people kind of juggling everything, a little bit of anxiety, but a, a really good feeling, but a really warm feeling too, just to, because this is my community here. I've been working 15 years uh, on trying to raise the level of empathy and my friends just love to be around all, all the different uh, people who are working on empathy and have made a lot of really great uh, friends. So, and I also want to thank, uh, all the volunteers who are working so hard to put these summits together. They're every two months and it's quite a bit of work to uh, put, pull all the organization together for that. And also want to uh, thank our partners and sponsor, and I'm going to show a screen here who they are just so you can see them. So we have uh, our center of building a culture of empathy and then the uh, foundation for developing compassion and wisdom. We have the Peace Alliance. We have uh, the Listen First uh, project. We also have the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. And we have the Conflict Transformation and Peace Building and Security, COPC. They have a group of about 65,000 people on LinkedIn. And we have the International Listening Association. And uh, you can also, if you want to be a partner, do uh, contact us and you can, um, I will put your logo here. And we also want to thank our financial sponsor, which is Potluck Action, which is Empathy uh, Organized. So we hope that you'll uh, join us in uh, being in, su in supporting these uh, events, uh, these summits going forward. And we, like I said, we hold them every two months and we hope to hold them at the Empathy Center, which you see in the background here, this is the actual painting of the center in Santa Barbara. So we have a very packed agenda today. There's uh, over two hours of presentations by empathy trainers and about two hours of an empathy circle at the end. Each uh, participant is going to have 10 minutes to introduce themselves and present about their training program. And at the, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to be keeping time and at the nine minute mark, I'm going to just give a little heads up, say, uh, give a nine minute warning just so you can sort of wrap up in the last uh, minute. And then um, for participants, uh, I just want to let you know, if you need to take a break, feel free to just get up and, and go, you know, do what you need to do. 
Uh, we're going to be recording this, so you can always go back and see any uh, parts uh, that you that you missed. And uh, so, since we have such a it's pretty such a packed agenda, we want to really keep on time here. And we have our first speaker, which is uh, Mimi Nicklin. And uh, Mimi is from Empathy Everywhere. She's a best-selling author, creative CEO, empathy advocate, and founder of EmpathyEverywhere.co, and also host of the uh, Mimi UU show. And she's coming to us, I think, from Singapore. Is that right? Is that where you? Malaysia, but Malaysia. Next okay, very close. So. I think it's like 1, 1 a.m. in the morning or something like that. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. And I'll turn it over to you to present about your uh, trainings that you do. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me and for being so empathetic with putting um, us over in Asia early. I know it's very early for you, but it's um, early in the agenda because it is the middle of the night here. I'm going to be very quick, given we've got 10 minutes. It's just the most it's just a great pleasure to open this I heard some of the conversation just before we started about how long this community has been building and of course from the minute I started working in empathy I knew exactly who you were um, and have been following from afar and sometimes it's very hard because of time zones so tonight as I said I'm very proud to be here um, as Edwin said there my name's Mimi and uh, the platform that I run is called Empathy Everywhere I'm gonna really try and talk as little as I can about us but that was the brief um, this evening but I just want to sort of kick off and talk about why we do what we do at Empathy Everywhere and I really hope that this rings true for so many of you and so many of the practitioners um, in the call this evening. I deeply believe that the more the world talks about empathy, the more empathy the world will have. And that is really what gets me up every single day is to create content, to create stories that enable us to elevate the conversation around empathy, which has shifted significantly since COVID. So whilst COVID was an incredible trauma for so many of us around the world, it did speed up the conversation about humanity and connection. Um, so really this is what we get up to do. I have nine people in my team now. Um, we're based all around the world. We're in six countries, um, but our work takes us everywhere. So I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse. Um, I don't really have a domestic market. Lots of you do. I work everywhere. I'm on a plane more or less every week, um, traveling the world, doing different forms of content to elevate this conversation and to make sure more people are talking about empathy and understanding what it is. Um, why? Because I believe this. I believe that we are all far more alike than we are different as human beings. But of course, if we don't make the effort to listen, to understand, we'll never be able to scale that understanding. So this is really what we believe. And fundamentally, our kind of raison d'etre, our reason that we get up is to overcome this horrendous statistic, which is that 52% of us on this call tonight, 52% of the world, that is over 4.5 billion people are lonely. And loneliness is not the lack of humans around us. It is about a lack of connection. So our work sees us move into every space we can to try and recreate connection. So whether that's in the media, you can see here with the BBC talking about the cost to the corporations, right? The cost to the world of loneliness, um, or whether it's through various different storytelling mediums. This is how we bring uh, the conversation to light within Empathy Everywhere. So there are many platforms that we have, but I just thought I'd tell you very quickly about three. I'm not gonna talk about my book, but I have a book and there it is. Um, the two I want to really talk to you about is um, my podcast, Me, Me, You, You, which is brand new. My first podcast was recorded in the pandemic from my bedroom. It reached 85,000 people um, and we finished with that last year. The new one launched this summer and is growing at 800% a month. So thank you if any of you are listening. Um, and the other platform I wanted to talk about is Open Room which is a brand new global events platform, which we're traveling around the world. It started in Africa. It's in Sri Lanka in two weeks time. It's in Dubai in four weeks time. It'll be in India in November. So it'll be in five countries by the end of the year. Open Room is an event in the real world um, where we gather people to hear the stories of others. So as I said earlier, we really believe that one of the biggest ways for us to create more empathy is to allow us to listen to people unlike us more often. So 
in a world of the like-minded, we create connection for the non-like-minded, which is very similar to the listening circles as well. So rather than me talk about it, I'm gonna play you just a very quick video and you can get a feel for what that event is. Hopefully the sound is working. If not, somebody please shout at me, but it should, uh, it should be working fine. So what you can see there, the way this format works, we have a sofa at the front of the room and we have three people in each event come and share a true story, their reality. In this event, this was in Cape Town in South Africa, we had uh, quite a lot of trauma, I would say, uh, but it's not always that way. It could be a love story. It could be about a 96 year old man who just got remarried, um, but it's a platform for people to come and share their story and for the audience to sit in that space and listen right, and empathize. We're talking about teaching people to be able to hear. That is obviously an in-person platform. Everybody can see everyone. It's a small group. As I said, it's traveling the world. The podcast is actually the opposite. So the podcast is entirely anonymous. So the, the role of the show is to invite people from all over the world, and please reach out if you want to share yours, to come and share your story without any risk of unconscious bias because there's no names and no location. So people can't judge you on your surname or your name or your religion from, from the name that you have. And people are sharing the stories that enable others, unlike them, to be able to step into their world and empathize. So we talk about this show being a show created to create empathy and not just talk about it. We should talk about it. Lots of people on the call today are talking about it. It's very important work. But for us, we believe in creating a platform that people can literally turn up and create empathy by hearing those stories. Um, and again, I just have a small snippet. This one came out just last week. Um, it's actually the first show I've ever had with two people. It was a father and daughter on the call. Um, and the daughter is a transgender teenager. And this is just a, a tiny piece of social content uh, from him. I had nothing to do with this. This is his, uh, his words in his own, in his own. I see a lot of lack of empathy around when people talk about the LGBTQI plus community, just the use of that set of letters for me, it seems, seems to trigger people these days into just lack of empathy people are just oh this anti-woke movement there's just this woke woke wokeness that's kind of politicized and it's taking away from the person that's there is a human being that sits there that's trying to live their life and why is it such a problem for you that these people want to live their lives the way they want to again tiny little clip but of these very candid very honest um pieces of commentary from people across the world who are living through their stories of loss of change of transformation so that you can tune in and hear people that perhaps you don't agree with, perhaps you don't even like it. But as we all know, empathy is not about agreement or judgment, but simply being able to understand. I see a lot of um, I do do lots of work in the corporate world. I'm not going to talk about it today. There are many, many phenomenal people coming that are going to talk about their workshops. Um, but fundamentally, the way I approach this is to create, I would say, awareness versus action. <laughs> Um, many of the people that are joining, and I know lots of them on the agenda, are delivering training to organizations. Again, the way Empathy Everywhere comes at this is to create awareness. So I don't want to go in and activate the organizations. I don't want to fix their workshops. I just want to go out there and elevate the awareness of why we need empathy, particularly in multi-generational workplaces, and what that means for the workplace of the future. Um, I'm not going to play this because I don't think we have a lot of time. Um, the other two pieces of work that we do um, is a lot of work with change makers, and that's basically students. This platform is called Do You See Empathy? It's for teens, and the next slide will show you the kids, where we're working with students and graduates on two things. One, how to create empathy in the world and why they need to fix it, right? They need to fix the world. They need to put us back together. We explain to them why when empathy is high, the isms, racism, ageism, sexism, whatever, are low, and the power they have to change the world if they are to embrace their empathy. But we also give them the skills to empathize with the workplace because empathy cannot only come top down. And they think it does, right? The students always say, but my boss should understand me because we are different. And we say that is absolutely true, but you also need to empathize with them, right? You need to understand them. So 
we're working with lots of student groups around the world. And this is probably some of the work closest to my heart. We're working with children, really little ones. Um, you can see here, some of these kids are five years old. They're all in India. Um, and we do workshops with them around storytelling and what empathy means. One minute. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story. When I started this work, I was pretty scared of the kids. I was like, can I teach children? And I went into this workshop and I didn't show any slides or anything. We, we told stories. A lot of my work uses the title is Empathy, Your Secret Superpower. And at the end of my first workshop, that little five-year-old top right, at the end when I said, what did you learn today? She said, Miss, I learned that empathy is like a superpower. So I took that as my sign from the universe that I'm doing what I should be doing. Um, and as I said at the very beginning, this is what I believe. I believe that the more the world talks about empathy, the more empathy the world will have. And what we're doing is telling as many of those stories on as many content platforms as possible to hopefully put more understanding of the work that so many of the speakers today are doing. So thank you very much. My name's Mimi Nicklin. Please come find me if you want any more information. And Edwin, thank you very much for having me and for allowing me to talk this evening. Thank you, uh, Mimi, and for being for taking the role of being the first speaker. I know you you're coming from Malaysia. That's uh, uh, really late there. So, um, just uh, if you want to stop the share screen share. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Yay. So okay. So our next speaker is uh, Leanne Butterworth. Uh, if we could find Leanne, bring her to the screen. And uh, so Leanne is uh, from Empathy First. She's an empathy speaker and educator. I believe you're in Australia now. So also this is like 1 a.m. in the morning. So really appreciate you uh, being here, Leanne. Take, take it away. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm already in tomorrow. So <laughs> it's 1 a.m., 1.20 a.m. here. So my name's Leanne Butterworth and I run Empathy First here in Australia. Uh, that is a social enterprise. I also lecture social enterprise at uh, the Queensland University of Technology. So teaching young people how to use empathy and business to change the world. So my mission at Empathy First is to create a world where everybody feels heard, valued, visible and safe. So I'm over here in Australia um, just to give you a little bit of context about Australia. Uh, so I'm in Brisbane. So you can see where the pin is there. We don't talk about empathy in Australia. It is not something we learn at school. There's a little bit of social emotional learning happening at, in schools now, but when I was growing up, it was, she'll be right, mate, suck it up. Um, we are very individualist country. So when Shopik did his uh, study back in 2017, he found that Australia ranked 45th out of 63 countries when it comes to empathy. Lots of myths around empathy in this country. Uh, empathy is something you're born with. You can't learn it. It doesn't belong at work. Uh, empathy is give, give, give. Empathy leads to burnout. It's just feeling the feelings. And it's also openly misunderstood and mocked. So a couple of years ago, uh, empathy training was in the news and it was absolutely panned. So that's what I'm working against. So just to give a little bit of context of the Australian um, culture, I guess, so the question then is, how did an Australian become an empathy trainer? Well, for me, it was this beautiful kismet, this collision of worlds where my experience, my history, so originally my undergrad in the late 1900s was in exercise science, sports psychology, and um, I, my postgrad was in social enterprise, human-centered design. I ran a project that used mental health uh, advanced mental health literacy workshops uh, and we did that through um, virtual reality simulations of psychosis and that was called the lose your mind project and then all the work that I've done in corporate and that then coupled with my own personal experience of late diagnosed postnatal depression and me realizing this power of empathy thing then is where empathy first came from so at the beginning of COVID, I couldn't do the virtual reality piece anymore. So I took it all apart and put it back together in uh, my signature framework, which is our wiser framework, which is the what is healthy empathy? What is this thing called healthy empathy? Because when I pulled Lose Your Mind Apart, that was the thing that people kept getting wrong. It's the thing that keep, people were most curious about. So I used all my research and all the pieces of 
content that helped me uh, when I was recovering and help that I'm most connected with. So it's what is healthy empathy? We then talk about introspection. So why does it matter to me personally, professionally? We look at unconscious bias. We look at value, stigma, judgment, uh, emotional literacy and go, okay, what's going on for me? We then look at self empathy. So really pulling apart who am I and what do I believe and how do I put myself and how do I have good boundaries? So that's our, that self empathy piece. Then talk about using your ears. So how to listen, what are we listening for? Uh, what does good listening look like and feel like? Uh, and then we talk about how to respond empathetically, what to say, how to be aware of your own stuff, uh, how to create that world where other people feel heard, valued, invisible and safe while also protecting your own uh, boundaries and your own mental health. The model that I use is based on Goldman and Ekman, and I kind of adapted a little bit to suit my Australian audience. So we are not, like I said, overly literate in this stuff. There are people who can't name more than three emotions. So the model that I use is we're really aiming for this central healthy empathy, but on one end, I've got emotional empathy. So we talk about unhealthy emotional empathy, which is our feeling for other people having poor boundaries, um, absorbing other people's stuff, making assumptions. So the imagery that I use is this taking on other people's stuff. And that's where burnout comes in. Up the other end, I've got unhealthy cognitive, which is I hear what it's like to be you and then I hand it back to you with a spoonful of judgment or I make it about me. In the middle is this healthy piece. Oh, you can see my friend feels um, sad. I'm not asking any questions. I'm not curious. So I'm just assuming that they're purple. In the middle, I've got this doing piece, this responding appropriately, this compassionate empathy is the ability to share and understand the feelings and perspectives of someone else and respond appropriately. And that's the piece where people's eyebrows go up and they go, oh, is that what it is? So because Australia is the second most individualist country in the world, me, 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 more, 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 I, 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 and they think that, emo that empathy is feeling the excuse me, feeling the feelings, they think you want me to feel more, you want me to jump down more rabbit holes, you want me just to give, give, give. And I'm like, no, we're actually coming back to centre. So healthy emotional empathy is then curiosity, listening, self-care, self-empathy, emotional literacy, the ability to name and understand an emotion. Up the other end, you've got healthy cognitive empathy. Curiosity, humanity, listening, imagining, growing, feeling with someone else. And you can see, I take on a little bit of them. They take on a little bit, bit of me. Like Mimi said, it's not all one way. It's a two-way street. So that's the model of empathy that, that I use and has resonated really strongly with my audiences. From that, we've created our theory of change, which is if we put healthy empathy at the center, we get employed, improved working engagement and well-being, improved customer service and satisfaction, improved business performance and customer loyalty, and improved relationships. And we do that through corporate empathy training, online empathy training, um, just trying to get that skill set out there. Uh, just a little insight into some of the results that we've gotten. Um, that's a picture of me at the Murray Art Museum of Albury, so a tiny little town. We were at an um, art museum doing empathy for cultural mediators. Uh, some of the results that we got. So this is an impact report that I do. Uh, you can see that it says there, I find I'm more calm when problems arise and I really try to engage with the person in front of me rather than preconceptions. Another person said, I feel like I have more of a toolkit at my disposal to know what to do in emotionally challenging situations. And another person said, I can use these skills to prevent myself getting overwhelmed and have better interactions with visitors. So that's really positive. So we measure a lot of the work um, that we do to make sure that we can practice continuous improvement, that we can really look at, what, at what's working because as we know, this is such a fluid concept. So anytime I go into an organization, it is always bespoke to that organization. Empathy training for cultural mediators is gonna be different to empathy training for private equity bankers. Um, some of the work that I've done is with like the Queensland Police Service, Department of Veterans Affairs, Domino's Pizza, private equity bankers, art museums, people who are starting to go, 
oh, this is a thing and we don't know how to do it. Um, and giving them really easy, accessible skills around that to make people go, okay, okay, I can do that. It's not something distant that's too hard and we push away. Uh, some of the things that I do. So in person, I fly to people and fly to corporations and fly to businesses and art museums. Uh, the last plane I was on literally had propellers. Uh, we do half day, full day workshops on what is empathy? How do you do it? So using our wiser framework. I have online courses. So one of the things, like I said, I found was the emotional literacy, not even emotional intelligence. Why do I feel the things? What is an emotion and how do I name it? Was something that really needed some work here. So I created online courses. I've got uh, how to write empathetic emails, which is a little freebie course, emotional literacy bootcamp, which is really um, low barrier to entry course and then the big one which is uh, empathy fundamentals how to practice empathy without burning out I've got the professional empathy podcast which I talk to different professions about and human experiences about the role of healthy empathy so I've spoken to a male sex worker a professional athlete a paramedic um, we've done empathy and aged care, empathy and menopause at work. So really looking at what is the value of empathy. The next three that I've got coming out is uh, empathy in the emergency medical dispatcher. So an ambulance One minute. operator. We've got empathy and uh, empathy is a drag uh, and empathy and the transgender experience as well with a friend of mine who um, is now Hannah. So that's, plus we've got quizzes and articles and all sorts of bits and pieces that we do. Um, so my name's Leanne Butterworth. I did a TEDx talk last year called Healthy Empathy Can Save Lives, including yours. Uh, and it's been beautifully received. It was one of those experiences where I went, oh, who knows what impact this is going to have. It's had big impact. I've had people reach out to me from all over the world saying, yeah, something in there. I can, I can do this. I can do this. So if you would like to reach out to me, my name is Leanne Butterworth. I am in Australia. I do talk all over the world, but we're going to hear from some amazing people today who I now consider friends. You can use the QR code there uh, and that will give you a, a access to all of my links and contact details. So yeah, I'm at Empathy First HQ. Okay, thank you, Leanne. Yep, you can the sharing. So we have uh, our next speaker is uh, Pascal. There we go. It's there. Uh, bring Pascal up. I'm here. Hi, Ellen. Oh, you're here. Okay, great. And uh, we can bring you up on the screen. And uh, I'll. Okay, there you light go. Is okay. Not good. Okay. The light, light is not good. So, so uh, I was, I'll introduce you. Pascal Gimperly yeah. uh, is from Conflict Transformation and Peace Building Network, or OPC. It's a, he's coming in from France. He was just taking his kids to, I think, some kind of an event, just returning back. So uh, take it over, uh, Pascal. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Elvin. I literally just arrived home at the minute. Uh, so, <laughs> all right, uh, so I'm uh, in a bit particular circumstances today. So we were in a mountain trail race with my girls. I run this morning. I'm still extremely tired. <laughs> and my one of my uh, girls, one of my daughters, she ran this afternoon and we just, we just arrived home. Uh, so it's a bit particular circumstances today. I hope you have uh, some empathy for my particular situation. Uh, I already postponed last time and I didn't want me to join, so I thought this time we, we go for it. Um, well, two or three words about myself. Uh, I'm a trained engineer before I went into development corporation for a couple of years. And uh, that's where I found out that actually, you know, engineering and facts and figures and <laughs> it's not all. There is something more, which is human relations. And that's when I did my uh, master's degree in peace and conflict studies. Sorry for my girl who's crying. <laughs> Uh, and did a, a master's degree in peace and conflict studies where I had one module on uh, mediation. That's how I got into the mediation. And I was really uh, extremely, uh, how to say, 
maybe overwhelmed or impressed better uh, by the, the, the approach of mediation and how actually we can solve uh, human conflicts other than through power pushing or even violence. Um, so that's fascinated me uh, extremely. I didn't know that was something like, you know, tools and processes and so on to, to do that. I thought, okay, it might just happen and then you're lucky. And if not, you're unlucky. But no, you can actually foster it and there are, there are tools to, to do so. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm the administrator of the, the, the COPIC network, Conflict Transformation, Peace Building and Security. Um, which is mainly an, an online network. So you can uh, connect if you wish to our LinkedIn group. There's the, the main group with 45 or 46,000 members now. We also have a subgroup on uh, mediation and uh, particularly. And you actually have a video. Uh, we have some kind of video podcast on, on YouTube. So a video with Edwin. Thanks again, Edwin, for, for uh, doing this with me. Uh, if you want to, to, to connect to that and to see uh, this uh, discussion. Um, and the uh, but where I mostly work on empathy is uh, with uh, Swiss. So I'm actually in Switzerland, uh, not France. Switzerland. It's also very close. <laughs> I was almost in in France this afternoon in the mountains. Um, uh, with the NGO called AE Center, where AE uh, is actually we define the name. Um, up of up, out of a symbol you know maybe this ae i don't know it has a, it has a name i don't know if in english it exists and exists in some languages like french it's like the ae connected and if you draw it nicely it it gives like a mirror um, uh, version you can, can mirror it both sides and uh, so the name actually derives from from that because it's the uh, the the change of perspective that we wanted to visualize which is uh, one of the core the core elements of mediation and and of empathy in mediation i'll come to that uh, right away um so we have this uh, mediation training where we have different uh, types of trainings also shorter ones but the main one is uh, accredited by the swiss uh, federation for commercial mediation um and it's uh, 120 hours so it's quite extensive um there's also some homework included and so on, um, but it's uh, several days. Uh, I don't even remember, like, I don't know, usually we do it seven times, three days or something like this approximately, uh, because mediation is really a profession. You need to get into it. You need to learn it really in depth. Um, although some tools you can learn relatively quickly, but if you want to to be really professional, it takes uh, obviously more time than just to read about a, a tool or to hear a tool once. You need to practice. We do a lot of simulation. We do a lot of uh, role plays. Uh, that's that's how people really acquire the, the, the competencies to do so. So the training includes... Uh, in the beginning, we start with some concept, concepts and theories about, about peace and conflict. You know, what, what, what is peace actually? Some kind of definitions. Uh, in some philosophies, peace is reached by the balance of power. You know, the more realist in, in uh, international relation terms, uh, balance of power. So everybody gets uh, armed enough so that no, nothing can happen. So peace is ensured by the fact that everybody is extremely armed and nobody will shoot first. Uh, that's not our vision, obviously. And there's the more, let's say, maybe liberal theory about peace, which is the, the rule of law. Uh, so uh, that, uh, how do you put this in English? Uh, humans are humans, wolves. I don't know if that's the right translation. <laughs> uh, so that we need, to, we need to put frontiers. We need to put people in a system of laws and rules so that they do not you know, uh, do violence to each other. That's still not our, our vision, uh, although it's obviously better than the balance of power. Our vision is the, the peace by peaceful, peaceful means. So it's important to foster and, and produce the, the competencies. And that's typically what you do with the different empathy trainings and we, we as well. Uh, you give people the tools uh, to, to be peaceful. Um, to, to get them more sensitive, to give them you know, communication tools and whatever. So to, to, to give space and to give room and competences and, uh, and sensitivity that, that peace is uh, not the rule of power and not the, the balance of power, uh, not the rule of law and not the balance of power. 
Uh, then we have some modules uh, on conflict behavior models, how people behave in conflict situations and how to get out of it, escalation models and how to get out of it, this type of things. It's relatively basic in the field of conflict uh, transformation as the entry point for the training. And then the more and more we get into intervention techniques, how you can actually to win if you have two or more people in conflict, how can you support them? How can you foster dialogue? How can you do a mediation? How can you structure a process? Um, and then and then we do the typical mediation at the end. Mediation as the, the tools that we have, you know, the 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 deontology, the tools, the questioning techniques, and so on. And this is first we start with, with just minor settings, so two to the one-on-one -on -one and the mediator. And then it goes into large groups, where it becomes very different, uh, usually because like in one-on-one, -on -one, we're much more into the empathy model. We're much more into getting to know each other, deepening understanding, uh, you know, know the other better, know yourself better. And the more you get into large groups, the more you get into the large groups, the more you have, you know, it's, it, it gets actually more a negotiation. It's more about the process you put, your more multi-level process, who meets when and whom and so on. It gets much more procedural and less empathy focused, I would, I would say. Um, so two, two main points I wanted to discuss with you today about specifically about empathy. Uh, two different dimensions, how we use empathy in, in, in our trainings and in mediation in general. So one is how to foster empathy between parties. And that's, that's really the core of mediation. Uh, that's why, as I said before, we have this changing perspectives um, symbol, the AE of, uh, of our NGO. Um, because the changing perspectives, it's, it's the key moment when the mediation switches from something, let's say, difficult, analytical, exposing positions, whatever. The changing perspectives, which is the word we use for empathy, it comes, it comes to the same. That's the moment when you switch to something more productive. So if each, each party understands, okay, I'm not totally right, and the other is not totally wrong. So th that's, that's the real turning point in, in mediation. Um, and for that, of course, you need to create the space, you know, the protected space by mediation, which is the protected space that we have by the fact that mediation is voluntary. Uh, each party can stop the mediation process at, at any moment. Uh, you don't have to engage for whatever, even between sessions, whatever. You can stop whenever you want. Usually people don't because they see the benefit. And also it's all confidential. It's totally confidential as a, as a, uh, I'm a sworn mediator. So I even have a, a legally protected uh, confidentiality, even that even the judge cannot call me to, to, uh, uh, how to say, to talk about the mediation, to talk about the contents of the mediation. Uh, One minute. Uh, so that's the space. And then through the questioning techniques, we get, we, we rise to empathy between parties. And the second part uh, shortly is uh, also interesting, the empathy between parties and mediator. And there is an interesting point, which is the difference between neutrality and impartiality. Uh, usually people confuse it or use the same uh, synonymally. Uh, neutrality is about the topics. So in mediation, two people, they have, uh, let's say, a conflict about the contract. I don't have any stake in the contract. No, that's neutrality. Impartiality is I don't have any stake in the, with the parties, with the actors. I don't know them. That's not my cousin. It's not, you know. So it's two totally different things. So people often in trainings say, but how we, we have to know to be impartial and, and neutral. How can you be empathic? I say, no, it's, it's very obvious. Now we have we have to be empathic. It's part of our tools. So you have to deepen the emotions. You have to deepen understanding. So, so you, if somebody, for instance, has a difficult That's emotional moment, if somebody has a difficult emotional moment, you have to deepen it. You have to go into it. So it's not that you're not neutral. It's that you use your mediation techniques. Thank you, Edwin. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Pascal. Also, thank you for being a partner for our summit series with, with uh, CoPC. Really appreciate it. So glad you could make uh, this uh, presentation. And uh, so we're going to go on to our next uh, presenter, which is Anita Novak. Let me bring Anita up on the screen. Yay, there you are. Uh, so Anita is, uh, you can see, uh, is from anitanovak.com. Anita is an empathy evangelist and author of Purposeful Empathy, a podcaster. She's been doing a lot of podcasts uh, recently. Very impressed with how many she does. I think one a week. 
and is also a keynote uh, speaker. So Anita, do you want to take it away? Thank you so much, Edwin. And it's so great to see so many familiar faces and names on this call. And I think what you're doing is amazing. And I think we're going to have a huge party when we finally all meet uh, in California. So I teach at McGill University, and that's where I actually did my PhD. I was really interested in developing curriculum for the next generation of leaders um, to become sort of change makers in the world. So for my doctoral degree, I interviewed social entrepreneurs, and those are the people that are already professional change makers. I wanted to understand uh, if they had anything in common and what they had in common, and if that could inform my curriculum and my pedagogy. And they were working on all sorts of different projects at different levels of scale, and they did have something in common without any exception. After dozens and dozens of interviews, I realized that they were activated by empathy. They saw people who were hurting, suffering, marginalized, disenfranchised in some way, and they felt the need to act on empathy. So I have been um, passionate about the power of empathy ever since. Uh, now I look at it from a personal lens, an organizational lens, and of course, a social change lens. And one of the things that uh, I learned while studying empathy um, is that we have the capacity to become more empathic through practice, thanks to our neuroplasticity. So when I came across that literature, I started doing all sorts of experiments and want to start with just a quick story that I think we can all relate to. And this happened to me maybe a dozen or so years ago. I was in a long lineup at a FedEx store um, waiting to send a package at, at the holiday season before we had phones attached to us to distract us. And it took about 30 minutes to get to the counter. And when I finally did, the woman that, you know, was who greeted me actually was really, really rude. And I really got triggered and wanted to call her out on it. But then I realized I had a moment to practice empathy. So I, I looked at her for a minute and I, I said, are you okay? And she took a minute to discern if I was being sarcastic and I wasn't. And she burst into tears and she said, my son's at home sick. I think I'm getting a fever. I've been working double shifts for two weeks straight. It's three in the afternoon. I haven't had a lunch break. I'm just exhausted. And we reached, I reached out for her hands and we held hands across the counter. I hated her 20 seconds earlier. And now we were holding what we call an empathic embrace. And I realized that empathy really is our superpower. So um, what the work that I do, I do training in four areas is in the personal realm, uh, at the organizational level with leaders and within cultures, and then at the social change level. Um, now, Going back to that story of me in that uh, empathic embrace with the woman, if somebody had been able to sort of see what my brain was up to, we'd realize that the pleasure and the reward centers would have been lit up because we were in this empathic embrace. So just like when we're eating delicious chocolate cake, if you like chocolate cake, or if we're even high on psychedelics, it's the pleasure and reward centers that light up when we are feeling connected emotionally. What also happens to our body is that when we're feeling this connection, all the bad hormones like um, the stress hormones that cause inflammation and chronic illness go down and the good hormones of serotonin and oxytocin go up and allows our bodies to function better, even improve our immune system. The only problem is, so empathy is really good for us, except when there's too much empathy, right? So we have all experienced at different times, sort of our limits, right? Where we achieve sort of a period of empathic overload or compassion fatigue, and that's happening more and more in our lives and in our workplaces. So the first training program I offer is how to practice self-empathy to become healthier, happier, and more productive. And this is really important given the stress and the burnout and the collective trauma that we've all experienced of the last few years that doesn't seem to be sort of shaking off with the constant change. And this matters, of course, in terms of how we are in our home lives and in our relationships. Um, now, moving to the organizational work that I do, some seven years ago, almost seven years ago, I started posting a daily empathy post, and I've not missed a single day. It's over, you know, I don't know, 2,500 days. Um, something interesting happened a couple of years ago where everyone started to pay attention to empathy in the workplace and empathic leadership. No kidding. 
Why? Because we heard about the great resignation. And then, of course, that was followed by just people who didn't leave, but weren't actually really present in the workplace or doing the quiet quitting. Right. So all these meta trends started to happen that, that you know, the undercurrent is the need for more emp empathy in the workplace, new technology that's coming in, that's kind of really questioning what it means to be human and how we're going to interface with machines. Uh, of course, psychological safety has become a big thing in the workplace, as it should be. Nobody wants to feel shame and people want to feel authentic. Of course, the DEI plus B belonging has become more and more and more important as it should be. Again, um, Gen Z entering the workforce with a different set of values. It's the first time in human history we have five generations in the same workplace. So all of this requires that we pay more attention to empathy. And what's interesting is that actually now that we've kind of gone through this post-COVID world of like, well, what, why does empathy matter and what difference does it make is that there's proof now, there's evidence that shows that empathy in the workplace drives all sorts of KPIs. Now, there's a delta still that I work with, right? So most employee and most CEOs understand that it improves business outcomes, but seven out of 10 say, oh, if I showed it at work, I'd be less respected. That's got to change. Even across the board, you know, two thirds of employees say, I get it. It's important for business success, organizational sex, success, but only one out of five say it's rewarded in the workplace. That's the delta that I try to work on. So the training that I offer is how to become a more empathic leader. And I'll talk later about how to become a more um, empathic organization. So when it comes to leaders, if we are feeling stressed out and anxious ourselves, our brains can't be in a state of empathy. Empathy at the same time. We can't do both simultaneously. So the training that I offer is a six-step process to actually become empathic despite whatever's going on around you um, so that you can actually really be supportive to your team and also practice self-empathy at the same time. In terms of the third training um, that I offer, how to co-create an empathic organizational culture is so important. And we want people to feel good about coming to the workplace. We want people to feel like they what their, their contributions matter and that the relationships that we have at work are also satisfying and productive and generative and collaborative. So the design thinking process that I use actually asks three questions where people come together and, and look at how we can practice self-empathy in the workplace, how we can practice empathy for others, and how the workplace itself and the organization itself can be more empathic. And through this design process, which could be like you know, half a day or longer, you can start developing a set of priorities on what the organization wants to work on to actually imbue the organization with more empathy for a happier and more productive workforce. So the fourth training program that I offer is how to elevate our empathic consciousness to change the world. So this is circling back to the origin story of my PhD. We all know about the UN SDGs. They are extremely important. Let's just quickly rush through the slides where we're sending you know, spaceships to Mars at the same time a billion people don't have access to safe drinking water. We've got more modern day slaves than ever. It used to be 27 million pre-COVID, now it's 54 million. People who live in fabulous lifestyle and then millions who do not. And look what we're doing to the world. We're doing something so strange to our living environment to do more of this does not make sense. And what the implications are, as we all know, sadly, is that the people who have contributed least to the problem are paying the price. Now, even at an aggregate level, we staring climate change in the face. We're also realizing that our mental health across the board, anywhere on the planet, at all levels of age, especially young people, our mental health is under siege. So we've got to create some change. So how do we do that? More recently, in addition to the SDGs, is a set of goals called the inner development goals. What change, you know, calling on Gandhi, be the change that you want to see in the world. How can we create the inner change that we need to create the outer change? So in the third column, you'll see that empathy and compassion is One part minute. of the work that we need to do. Now, you'll recall um, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Achieving our full potential was everything that humans wanted to achieve. Well, just before he died, he said, no, it's about self-transcendence, achieving a sense of purpose beyond the self. So the third, the, the fourth bit of work that I do is 
um, unpacking a framework of purposeful empathy, that outer rim is really important. The honoring of our interdependence and oneness, the spiritual work of empathy, and then the political work of empathy, which is the bottom rim, striving for peace, justice, equity, and sustainability, challenging the status quo. So you can read about this in the book that I wrote. Uh, you can also link in with me. And of course, as uh, Edwin uh, graciously mentioned, I've um, got over, I guess, about 150 interviews with people who I believe are also part of the empathy revolution. Um, thank you so much, Edwin, for, for bringing us all together and, uh, and for letting me share what I'm up to. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Anita. And uh, our next uh, speaker is Sharon Steed. We could we could stop the uh, screen share and bring Sharon up. Here we are. Hello. Sharon, see you be up on the screen in a second. Yeah, there you are. So welcome, Sharon <laughs> Steed. From so let me just quick introductions from uh, Communalog, uh, making empathy actionable. You have uh, a, a LinkedIn training that's super popular. You have like five hundred thousand students, uh, you're a keynote speaker, and you write articles on engaging empathy. So uh, take it away. Uh, Aaron. Dutterer. If I can get this on full screen, we can uh, get started. Give me one second. So I'm a person who stutters. And of all of the uh, titles that I have in my life, I am a wife, I am a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend, I'm a career woman. Of all of those titles, this is the one that has been the most all-encompassing. It is the one that has defined me in a way that has been um, a lot of uh, shame. I've had a lot of embarrassments um, and I have felt um, incredibly alone as a result of just not sounding like other people. And I've felt this way ever since I was around three years old uh, where uh, you can see here, um, I am around that age there and uh, I know I'm painfully adorable. But um, this is around the age that I began to show signs of having some kind of speech impediment. But um, my parents weren't all that concerned because a lot of kids around this age um, either stutter or they have a lisp. And um, the vast majority of them sort of outgrow their speech impediments by the time they hit you know, first or second grade. Well, obviously that is not what happened with me. And so I developed these sort of communications neuroses where I would try to do things um, during conversations where I could avoid stuttering. I would ch ch change words um, in my head. I would avoid certain sounds that I knew that, you know, is probably going to have a hard time just spitting out quickly. And then I eventually sort of came to this point in my life when I just decided that I wasn't going to be talking to people anymore. And so I would just avoid situations where, you know, I would um, have to do things as simple as just saying my own name. Because as a person who stutters, one of the hardest words to say uh, with fluency is, coincidentally enough, your own name. But, you know, eventually I sort of, you know, I... I, I grew up. I went to college. I was in my 20s. I went to the workforce. And um, it became very clear that me stuttering and me avoiding talking was not going to align with me creating the kind of life and the kind of relationships and the kind of connections that I really wanted to have. And so uh, that's when I decided to pursue public speaking. And um, it was actually at the suggestion of um, a speech therapist. And she was um, just saying, hey, I can help you, you know, speak um, a lot easier here, but you have to be comfortable with stuttering first. And so I said, okay, fine, I'm gonna try this out. 
And so, and so I began to pursue public speaking as a way to sort of overcome this fear. I thought I could give a couple of talks and I would be cured and never be afraid to speak again. Here's me at uh, one of my first talks that I ever gave. Um, it was about patience in um, a fast paced world. And, you know, being a person who stutters in a society that really appreciates things done very, very quickly. And so, you know, I would give these talks and people would come up to me afterwards and say, hey, I really appreciated your message of empathy. And I said, wow, I didn't say empathy not once in that entire talk that I gave, but it dawned on me that people felt very comfortable with hearing me speak and hearing me stutter and hearing me speak about stuttering because they all had insecurities too and they all had vulnerabilities too and because I was you know on a stage and sort of exposing this very personal this very shameful part of myself they could see themselves in me and in my struggle as a result of that they were able to really pay attention to me Header, to really, you know, hear what I was trying to say. They open themselves up to, you know, hear this different perspective. And they really were able to connect in a very sincere, um, beautiful way. So, you know, as a result of that, I really decided to just, you know, dive into talking about empathy, here's me at a more recent conference. I look uh, a lot more confident, a lot more capable because that's how I felt at that point. But I say all of that to say that because I was so insecure and because I was so afraid, that was the gateway to me learning about empathy, teaching empathy and encouraging other people to really connect as a result of just being a little more vulnerable and to teach them how to really gain the perspective that they, you know, so desperately need if they want to create good products and foster amazing relationships. So hello, my name is Sharon Steed. I am um, a keynote speaker and empathy consultant. Uh, my company is called Communalog, and I'm also obviously a person who stutters. And so just to give you um, a little bit of background on me here, I've spoken at over 100 companies and conferences. I mean, at this point, it's probably over 200, um, spanning, you know, 18 countries and five continents. I have spoken in um, a ton of different industries as well. Um, I have a course that uh, 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 everyone brought up, um, it's called Communicating with Empathy. Um, another course I have that's um, also available on LinkedIn Learning is called Driving Inclusion with Empathy. And um, I really come from empathy uh, from the perspective that the best way to really, you know, show and engage empathy is to um, come at it from the way you communicate, right? Because how we speak um, is going to go back to how we think and how we think is going to go back to how we feel. And so I use my um, speech impediment to really get into the feels and then we sort of grow from there and, uh, you know, how we speak to people and how we approach conversations. I have a book on um, empathy at work. It's available on um, O'Reilly Media's library. And here are just um, a few of the clients that I've been incredibly privileged to work with in the past. So I uh, focus on keynotes and talks in my practice. Um, so at the beginning of this presentation was just a little taste of uh, what I do when I go on a stage and how I really try to connect with people. Um, but the goal of, you know, all of my talks is to, you know, hit people to think about empathy as a verb, as a choice. And I want them to really make 
empathy, uh, 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 actionable. And I do that through teaching these key empathy behaviors. And those are patience, perspective, and connection. And I talk about these things, you know, these are, um, you know, like ideas that we've been talking about ever since we've been, you know, extremely young people, but I try to change it from just really cool ideas or, you know, we need to be patient. We need to understand, right? No, no, I say, here's how we do this in a more corporate setting. And so, um, yeah, you know, these key empathy behaviors have been my um, pride and joy. I've been able to talk about these things in relation to vulnerability, uh, to being a person who stutters, and to, um, you know, teach people how to really engage in the proper behaviors that are going to increase empathy and also to sort of decrease um, you know, things like that are going to take away things like inclusion, right? And so the whole point of these key empathy behaviors is to talk about, you know, how do we improve collaboration? How do we have more positive communication? How do we create more inclusive cultures? It's through these key empathy behaviors. So if you would like to get more information on me, I am um, very active on LinkedIn. I post about um, empathy and vulnerability. Um, I post post days of the week. I also do some videos. Um, And yeah, here's all of my contact information. If you are more into the QR code life, here's a QR code with... um, all of the links that you would need to learn a little bit more about me and my keynotes and my approach to empathy. So I just want to thank you, Edwin, for inviting me. And it's, I've been really, really enjoyed hearing um, all of the talks from all of these incredible practitioners. And this is such a cool event. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sharon. And we'll bring up uh, Jim Morton. And I'll just mention we're at the one hour mark. So we're really moving, keeping on track here. So thanks everyone for keeping us on track. Uh, I will, somewhere in the chat, I'm going to just welcome new participants. Uh, people have been dropping in uh, and I just want to welcome you to our to our to today's uh, summit. And there's also, if you leave early, there's a link there to uh, fill out a feedback form. So I'll be posting that periodically. So uh, welcome, uh, Jim. Uh, Jim is from the Seattle Aquarium, uh, where he's fostering empathy for wildlife, and he's vice president of the conservation, engagement, and learning at the uh, Seattle Aquarium and doing empathy teaching there. So take it away, uh, Jim. Uh, Thank you, Edwin. Can you see my slides okay? Yes, see the slide now. Yep. Great. Well, thanks. As Edwin mentioned, I'm Jim Morton. Um, My pronouns are he and him. I'm the Vice President for Conservation Engagement and Learning at the Seattle Aquarium. Uh, And now we're going to talk about something completely different. Uh, My goal is to share a little bit about the content and uh, kind of how the workshops flow for us. But uh, what I'm sharing today, what we're sharing is probably going to be a little different than most of the presentations we hear today, because we are specifically interested in how we can encourage empathy for non-human animals. And I'd like to start by introducing you to our friend Rialto. So this is Rialto, or at least the way we first met him. Rialto was a sea otter pup that was found abandoned and alone on Rialto Beach along the Washington coast. It's not uncommon for sea otter pups to strand, but it is relatively uncommon for them to find their way into our care. The campers who found Rialto made the right calls, connected the right people, and a few weeks later, Rialto looked like this. And I, I can practically hear the awes coming through the screen. Uh, thanks to the work of the teams at the Seattle Aquarium and its partners, Rialto, who came to us very sick, made a remarkable recovery and now lives in his forever home at the Vancouver Aquarium. And Rialto is not why we got interested in empathy because all I have to do is show you two pictures and tell a half-hearted version of his story, and you all have empathy coming out of your ears for Rialto. So when we were approached by a funder a few years ago who was interested in fostering empathy for animals and children, we got to thinking about some of our less, I think, what we would say, uh, traditionally charismatic animals. So animals like barnacles and sea anemones 
or even averse to animals like sharks or eels. We became interested in whether we could generate empathy for these animals in service of their conservation. And that's just the thing for us. We're not just interested in empathy, although we certainly believe that more empathy makes the world a better place, but we're interested in how empathy might facilitate conservation and conservation outcomes. We are the most disconnected, connected society in human history. We could reach each other or answer a question with a couple of clicks, but we don't know where our food comes from. We don't know where our waste goes. Uh, the more metropolitan and digital we become, the less connected we feel to animals and habitats and nature. And we believe empathy could be a tool to help reconnect humans with nature and each other. So to be fair, those are not different things. Humans didn't become unnatural when we started building things or creating technology. Uh, that connection to nature may feel distant, but that's an illusion. And it's one that we've created. In the end, conservation is not a habitat or an animal problem. It's a people problem. People are both the problem and the solution, not to mention the beneficiaries. So we think empathy is part of that solution and a tool that can help us sort of reestablish or reveal that connection with the natural world. And so while I know you're gonna hear a lot of definitions of empathy today, I'm gonna to give you one more, but I'm gonna explain one important way that it's different. So we believe that empathy is a stimulated emotional state that relies on the ability to perceive, understand, and care about the experiences or perspectives of another person or animal. Most definitions of empathy are about people sharing emotions or perspectives with other people. Uh, we felt it was important to expand the idea of perspectives to be more inclusive of the experiences of non-human animals. So as an example, a sea star may not have a brain to generate complex thoughts and emotions, but if you try to pluck one off of a rock, it'll catch your shadow, it'll hold on tight. I'm not suggesting that the sea star is afraid of your hand, but it has a predictable experience of the world through stimulus and response, and we can understand that and appreciate it. So in our workshops, we distinguish four constructs under that empathy umbrella. Uh, we've heard a little bit about some of these today already. Affective and cognitive empathy are about perspective taking. Uh, motivational and positive are really about what you do about it. Uh, of course, affective empathy is about that shared emotional state or shared perspective. I feel what you feel. This relies on social mirroring and it, it honestly may not be all that realistic between humans and most non-human animals. Uh, while we understand what a shared smile between us may mean, Chimp smiles, as an example, are very different. When a chimp smiles, that represents fear and stress. So if you smile at a chimpanzee and they smile back, y'all are not having a shared emotional experience. A motivational empathy is also sometimes called compassionate concern, and that's a response to suffering. Uh, also not ideal in a zoo or aquarium setting. Uh, for these reasons and others, we really hone in on cognitive and positive empathy. And this uh, is the poster hippo of positive empathy for Zeus and Aquariums. You may know this adorable little hippo as the social media superstar Fiona. Fiona was born prematurely at the Cincinnati Zoo and made a, the zoo made this brave choice to share her struggle and recovery from the very beginning. And that was risky, but it paid off big time. The sight of Fiona like prancing and playing in her habitat brought so much joy to people's hearts that they couldn't help but want to help her. So their reaction uh, or this reaction to or desire to extend the joy or well-being of others, that's what we call positive empathy or empathic joy. And not only did people line up to support the zoo and Fiona's hair, uh, care, they also donated to support the zoo's work with hippos in the wild. Now, when you look at animals like Fiona and Rialto, you begin to see patterns and the characteristics that typically engender empathy for animals and people. People feel more comfortable empathizing with animals that have agency, affectivity, coherence, and continuity. Agency just means that an animal takes an action to meet its needs, it grooms or it plays. People can recognize this and relate to it. Affectivity in people would be like facial expressions or body language. That works for some animals, but by and large, people misattribute activity for affectivity. So an active animal is happy and healthy. A sedentary animal is sad or depressed. Now, coherence just means that it looks like an animal. It has arms, legs, a face. You may never have seen a pangolin before in your life, but if you're presented with a pangolin, you immediately accept that this is an animal. 
An anemone is a totally different story. It looks as much like a flower as it does an animal. An anemone has a coherence problem. Now, finally, continuity is just the time we spend with animals. This is the why we, we're sure that we know exactly what our pets are thinking and feeling. Now, the reason these characteristics engender empathy for animals is because they're characteristics that we see in ourselves. Uh, we naturally see connections and kinship with animals, but that's not always a perspective that's encouraged. Uh, it's why we also talk about anthropomorphism in our workshops. So the attribution of ostensibly human characteristics to non-human animals and objects. This is a very hot button topic for zoos and aquariums, especially. Now, these images show you both the perils and opportunities of anthropomorphism. It's hard, it's likely hard for you to, um, to describe these animals as doing anything other than kissing. Uh, in fact, these fish are called kissing gouramis for this behavior specifically. Uh, on the one hand, anthropomorphism is just a way that we understand animal behavior. It's just, you know, what we call learning. We're using experiences or, for, or a phenomena that we're familiar with to understand new experiences. What these marmots are doing is, is very analogous to kissing. They're doing it to experience closeness, exchange smells, to reinforce pair bonds. To look at this and think of it as kissing is pretty accurate. It's actually a very useful metaphor. The Grammys, on the other hand, they aren't bonding. They're fighting. This is a dominance display. It's not kissing in the same way that chimps aren't smiling. And it, it illustrates how thinking anthropomorphically can be dangerous when you don't understand the animals and their biology and behavior. So this kind of framing leads to feeding animals in the wild or rescuing seal pups off of beaches. We also discuss these six practices or techniques that can be used when you're developing programs or exhibits or experiences. Uh, these are things that research has shown effectively help our audiences engage in perspective taking, see animals as uh, individuals with a lived experience, and generally just feel more empathy and connection with animals. So those practices are, are proper framing, uh, building the knowledge of animals, engaging the imagination, uh, providing rich sensory experiences, modeling, and of course, because empathy is a skill, practice. So our typical audience for workshops or zoos and aquariums and other settings with live animals, um, but they would be interested in, uh, interesting and appropriate for any setting where uh, you're exploring the relationship between humans and the natural world. Now, today we've done uh, 30 workshops for institutions in 32 states in the D District of Columbia. So like 70 zoos and aquariums, 80 orgs total with a combined annual attendance of over 75 million. You can see here is kind of the typical layout of a workshop. We spend day one uh, just tearing apart and examining concepts of empathy and anthropomorphism. Uh, we do that through activities and dialogue. Day two is all spent taking what we've just learned and applying it in settings and projects that are relevant to the host institutions and their work. Every workshop is different, tailored to that particular setting and participants. If you'd like to learn more about our workshops or any of our empathy work, please do come visit our website. Uh, you can read about the workshops, view a schedule uh, and recordings for our empathy cafes, which are a one hour conversation with professionals in the empathy space. You can also see materials and presentations from the last two developing empathy for conservation outcomes conferences. So talks and other, other materials that came from those conferences, plus our, our, our publications, workshop materials, a suite of evaluation tools that were developed for this work and a lot more. So please see us there. If you have any questions, please reach out Edwin Thank you so much for including us and our animal focus uh, in this amazing group of speakers. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for uh, joining us and for your presentation. So we have our next uh, speaker, who's uh, Shelton Davis. If we could bring Shelton up on the screen. And here we go. I'm here, hey. I'm here. Hey, Shelton, great. So. Uh, See, so Shelton is from Empathy Lab. He's a listener, a CEO, founder, and uh, community builder at EmpathyLab.inc. And he's a UX research design and innovation leader. So take it away, Shelton. Here we go. All right. Let's see if I can sh do well and share my screen. Uh, boop, bop, beep. Is it loading? Is it there? Yes? Yes. Okay. Did, right? All right. Thanks. Um, my initial thought before getting into my, my piece here is how does one follow the cutest hippo ever? Um, Jim, thank you. Uh, it, it's, 
it, it was it was great and and the otter um so glad it's uh, healthy again Hi, i'm shelton davis i am south of atlanta georgia um just a little bit south in cow country and confederate flags um so i have an interesting space and place to practice empathy not just with myself but with others so the one thing that i do um consistently and i say i i mean we it's not just me that's doing this um is i think the world is getting going too quick and my headphones just died can you hear me yeah, so right, yes yes we you. still hear you all right my headphones just died what I want us to do, because we are moving in a world that's too fast, um, that is going one to one to one, many meetings, many meetings um, over uh, overlapping each other. I want us to take a few seconds. Let's say we're going to go 45 seconds and we're going to check in with each of our five senses. All right. So I want everyone out there to take a deep breath. In your nose. Out your mouth. And the first sense that I want you to focus on is the sense of hearing. So if you can, listen to what's around you. Your mind can wander, but it's okay. And that's what minds do. Next up, sense of touch. Now, if you're sitting down, how does how do your feet feel on the ground, back of your legs on your chair? How are your shoulders right now? Next up, smell. Now take a deep breath in your nose if you can. Uh, I know allergies and, and colds are around right now, so take a deep breath in your nose. What are you picking up? All right. I'm going quick. Next, taste. We're at different hours of the day. Someone might taste coffee or toothpaste because they're going to bed at 2 a.m. Thank you for showing up. Um, what do you taste? And last but not least, see. <laughs> what do you see? Look around you. You've been in probably that office or that space many times. Change your perspective. What do you see in your space? Practice empathetic eyes. Change the perspective. No judgy eyes, as I like to tell my community. All right. So I... I'll tell you very quickly why I do this. We have to check in with ourselves before we can be with other people, all right? And I'll tell you in a minute or two how I do this with uh, clients, with communities, with myself. Yeah, we'll go there. So just like Sharon had, I've got a cute picture of me too. Um, so there's me on the, the top left. Um, grew up in Southern California. Um, very curious kid, religious household, non-religious household. It was it was a lot of things to deal with. Um, five languages in the house, so it made it, uh, I knew when I was in trouble. Fast forward, this energetic kid um, that did all the sports, um, my mom needed me to go do something, so I ran track. Um, and it's significant in my life because even the coach said, you're doing too much, so he made me a decathlete. That means that I like taking in a lot of information and I have a lot of energy. Um, so don't don't try and out energize me. Um, I will probably keep going. In school, I studied psychology uh, and got my master's in industrial design. That combination put me in a position to empathize with users, do this design thinking process that you see right here and create things that people need. So this was empathy in action, but empathy towards a goal of making someone money, making uh, an experience uh, enjoyable. And in that process, I realized that the teams that I was on, um, the companies that I was within, did not have a good empathetic practice internally. 
Um, and as I was trying to design um, great things, I was also trying to build a community inside. And so I quickly realized um, I can make products until the cows come home, but I wanted to really help more people. All right. So with a good friend, uh, yeah, next, um, Teresa, we started going into companies, doing workshops on how to learn what, about what empathy is. As with all startups, hurdle, um, we, we hit some hurdles and we realized that um, if uh, that people got this deer in headlights look when you told them about the different types of empathy and all the statistics and all this stuff. So could everyone do something for, uh, for me right now? Do the like the deer in headlights, like confused look. Can you just like, uh, what are you talking? Yeah, I got that a lot. And on Zoom, it's really powerful because the pandemic in Zoom made deer in headlights look real. So I went back into what I did um, in track and field and we created, and I created this thing called the Empathy Decathlon. We've been training this, across the United States. And we did some work in Berlin and Bangkok. So uh, it's crossing cultures. But the, the the big part of this is, is breaking down empathy in a way that makes it understandable to <laughs> a six-year-old to uh, a, a 96-year-old. Uh, and here's how we've broken it down. It's 10 skills. And these are 10 things that most people understand and know how to do. First five skills are really me empathy. How do I look within myself? And I helped you and you did it with me do a self-awareness practice that I have CEOs and interns do. So we look into ourselves and see what's giving us energy, what's held, holding us down as baggage. You know, what type of inventory might we see? We take people through a power and privilege dynamic um, wheel to kind of understand what power and privilege do they have in their company, in their community at different times um, at different uh, um, seasons of their, their profession. And then we transition them into with listening, because we have to listen outside of us with not just our ears, but you know our full selves. We transition into we empathy, where we talk about responding, asking, making meaning of what we heard before we jump into this feedback. Um, we've, we've, a lot of clients just love going straight to feedback, but they're never prepared because they don't know what baggage they're bringing into it, what energy they don't have for it, or what biases they might have. So we take everyone through these, these uh, 10 skills, these 10 micro skills, and help them become leaders at whatever uh, place they are in. And we typically like working ground up versus top down because there's a lot of apathy at the top of these you know, company pyramids. So if I can get the individuals on the bottom in the trenches, to understand what empathy is and practice it to, uh, with themselves and up, things go really well. All right. So as I said earlier, I don't do this by myself. I do this with a team. Empathy is a team sport. All right. And so what you see on the left in this little um, animated GIF is my team. Um, this is Nadine. Mary is in a little photo there. Teresa's holding it. Um, you have Susan Lambert with her son, Akasha. Eustacia, myself, the tall guy in the middle, uh, Pame, and Amy. And these individuals have trained with me and, I, and and they teach me so much from their areas of life on how to bring empathy into more places. We do it in a few ways right now. Um, we have an empathy athlete community, which is open for everyone. So if you want to join, come, come on over. What we do is we we focus on a topic a week. We have a, a, a dialogue on Wednesdays and Fridays, and we see- One where minute. We're Thank you. Um, and it's never you're never alone. I, I think earlier we talked about this, this epidemic of loneliness. This community is for, for not just for lonely people, for, but for those that want to be seen, heard, and cared for by other practicing empathizers, all right? Um, we also do full uh, and short empathy to calf form practices, really depending on the discovery work we do with community or team so that we can meet them where they're at. Um, and then we have, because we're a lab, we do, we explore, um, we are looking into, uh, how does empathy and AI work together? We're bu building a course for teachers and students. Heck, we're, we're <laughs> If someone brings it to our plate and we can get some funding for it, we'll, we will start researching it. That's, that is that is me. That I'm sorry, no hippo 
photos. Maybe we can get Jim to come back and show us that one again. But I, I appreciate everyone that's that's spoken um, and where empathy is going. Edwin, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Shelton. So our next speaker, and if you stop to share, thank you. Good to see you. Is uh, Amy Wilson? If we could bring Amy up on the yeah. screen. Now we have this, the uh, okay, live show. So let me introduce you, Amy. You're from Empathy for Change. You're co-creating the future of work and doing organizational design. Author and founder of Empathy for Change. Uh, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you for having me, Edwin. And it's so great to be following. Um, Shelton, because we've been having lots of lovely, like really rich conversations. And this is something that I hope that we get to have conversations more with more people on the call here. Um, I'm Amy J. Wilson. I'm pleased to be speaking with you today about a few new training opportunities. And this is like, I just launched a new brand. So this is the first time I'm actually using my brand. So I'm excited about that. And here's a couple of things I've got cooking up with me and my cooperative. Um, so I've asked a few of these questions um, for most of my career, and I've tried to untangle them with each new challenge that I've been doing. So for example, I'd love to hear in the chat, like from, from some folks, like, what do you think what a modern organization looks like? Um, you know, I, I'd love to read that when I'm finished here. Um, but I've been especially thinking about how we've been designing intentionally or not, our modern workplace and how we treat each other in that workplace. And specifically how we work, how we feel and treat each other at the end of the day. So many of us are questioning this role of work in this modern world and our relationship to it. And along the way, I found two major problems. The first problem I'm seeing, um, study after study is showing that we are going through a mental health crisis right now. And which is leaving many of us burn out. Um, but what this also is interesting, it blocks empathy. So it's a it's largely a result of empathic stress, distress, which is similar to compassion fatigue. And when we're in this heightened state of fight, flight, or freeze, or even feign, we put our blinders on and we stop caring about the people around us and just try to get through the day. So over the past year, I've been co-creating and testing out with my cooperative um, we have formed to develop healing for work. Um, this is a coaching cir circle offering. Um, we, Our colleagues and I pull in various methods to design this offering, social and emotional learning, dialectical behavioral therapy, mindfulness, just to name a few. Um, and Healing for Work is a coaching circle designed for professionals who are suffering from burnout and to sustainably recover and gather in authentic support in safe and a secure environment. Um, we select these cohorts um, and we work, focus on our mental health, but also share stories of successful implementation in their environments. So there's three... R's of recovery, we're calling this, from a place of burnout, is number one, we talk about regulation, number two is relationships, and three is resilience. How do we build resilience within ourselves? And each one of those modules are three-month modules, and it's done over a course of nine months. And we actually are launching this first for um, some of the areas that are most in need of help, and that's K-12 to educators. So I'm working specifically with K-12 educators to design this for, um, for these educators that are out there. And I have two other um, fields that I want to grow up and, and work in. And I can also modify all of these things for um, the company companies out there as well. And so um, at the end of the day, we're building better relationships with ourselves, building better relationships with each other, and that resilience that we need so that we can take on tough challenges and not get burned out in the future. And that's kind of part of my story too. Um, the, uh, these are six steps that we've identified around transformation. I, I'm very, I have lots of different interests and I bring them to work here. And so um, we come from this place of transformation, whether it's a individual um, space or an, um, a, or a company space, there's six steps to it. So we really um, 
coming out of denial that we've had workplace dysfunction, exploring what it is, sharing and challenging our assumptions, setting our boundaries, learning, and sometimes unlearning old behaviors, and then continuously improving at the end of the day. So, you know, it's, you can do this in teams, you can do this with individuals, or you can do it with um, your organization. And I've done it at all three levels. Um, so the second problem I've seen is that organizations want to evolve, but they're not sure how. So nearly three years ago, which is wild to think, I wrote this book, Empathy for Change, How to Create a More Understanding World. And since then, I've worked with dozens of clients that want a repeatable roadmap for me to tell them how to change. So everything from the director of national intelligence and uh, working with 17 intelligence agencies in the federal government to small community colleges in rural Pennsylvania. So I've reached quite the gamut um, and I've worked with Jobs for the Future as well as a director of Moonshots. And uh, a central focus of my book and work is this overlap between empathy on one side and innovation on the other, and then trying to figure out how do we build a culture of those things and scale it across the across the enterprise? And so the overlap of these two domains that I've seen is that they both require a deep transformation and it requires context. So there's not a one size fits all approach. There are some similarities, but it's very complex and it's very difficult. And this is why a lot of people don't do this work. Um, and so, but there's two truths that I've found um, when working through this transformation that organizations are looking for. And the first one is transformation requires a movement and not a mandate, right? Shelton mentioned, I don't always go from the top, right? Often change is like, well, we're going to all do this. And then <laughs> every, it's just so be it, right? And so we know that open is, the world in the future is open and participatory, participatory and peer driven. Um, and so it's increasingly so. So I have experience in building movements. I was the director of innovation in the federal government and built this thing called the Better Government Movement and worked with hundreds of agencies across government to kind of see how do we engage innovators and early adopters to take change and put it into scale. And so another thing I think about when I think of transformation at scale, it requires empathy and compassion. And so almost all successful modern workplaces do these three things. Um, they, they, there's an awareness that comes with empathy uh, for all them. So number one, they understand the challenges and empathy is crucial to all this because you have to use this to commit to meeting the needs of employees and your customers. The second phase or second piece is that designing with compassion and Shelton and I share this view of, um, of like, how do we, like what, how do our identities show up and how do we make sure we co-create solutions and products, programs and services that meet our audience's needs? And then at the end of the day, how do you deliver um, equitable um, outcomes for the people who are involved? So making sure that you are your service program or product not just meets their needs, but but like you know like you know what those needs are, but helping to meet them and continually making sure you're improving. So this is a signature offering um, that 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 I'm excited to be like launching right now with our cooperative. We've been kind of being on the stealth mode, building this out, but it's it's bringing together a lot of different things that we've learned. And it is three phases that help us to discover and build context and prepare um, for um, a change and how do you build at scale empathy, um, a, a community around empathy and learning, learning of those early adopters and innovators how do you incubate and design it with empathy at the center? And number three, how do you launch, test, and scale? And I have worked with entrepreneurs. I am an entrepreneur myself and uh, in uh, other different settings. I've, I've, I've worked in um, um, startup accelerators as well and led uh, um, entrepreneurs to do this. So I'm bringing in some lean startups, some agile 
and human-centered design into this process. Um, so the offering is a bigger commitment towards organizational and, and systemic change. It's participatory and transparent. One minute. Yep. Um, thank you. Um, and here's a couple of frameworks um, that 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 we have been using quite a lot. Um, you may have seen the U.S. Surgeon General's framework for mental health and well-being on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side is my empathy and action framework on how do you create um, a framework for us to work through and create a repeatable model. So here's a little bit of um, I'll drop this link in the chat. I have a whole menu of offerings of things that I do personally, um, people in my cooperative that I work with, um, and you can subscribe to my newsletter on LinkedIn uh, called Empathy in Action. Here's my contact information. I'd love to work with you and to talk to you more about, about how can we collaborate because there's so many like great like wisdom on the room in the room here. So thank you for having me and thank you to Edwin for, for bringing us together. Uh, thank you, Amy. So good to see you here. Uh, thanks for joining us. So uh, we have our next speaker. Uh, if we stop the screen share there, we can. Yeah, you can show show me. <laughs> uh, one second. There we go. Yay. Hey, hey, Lou. I was so, concerned that was my screen for a moment. <laughs> no, it's it's progressing here. So we have, uh, thanks, Lou, uh, for joining us, Lou Augusta. Uh, LouAugusta.com is your your website, and you're an empathy consultant, author, and empathy trainer. And you said you would take it away from there. So take yes, it away, thank Lou. Thank I'm, I am, well, so first of all, I acknowledge you, Edwin, and the work you're doing. After many years, it shows you the value and the importance of persistence. This thing has got legs and has every evidence of taking off. So keep up the good work. I am humbled and uh, inspired. I am humbled and inspired by what I've seen so far. It, I mean, I got a lot of work to do to catch up with some of, some of the colleagues on this call. So I thank you for that. Um, I do actually have a PowerPoint slide, which I will be sharing with you. Um, I'm good, so may I introduce myself? Um, I deliver empathy lessons every week at Ross University School of Medicine at St. Anthony Hospital here in Chicago to a class of third year medical students. My claim to fame is that as Edwin graciously indicated, I'm the author of three peer reviewed books on empathy. I, kind of, I branded myself a rumor of empathy. Uh, a colleague said to me in a kind of devaluing way, what's this empathy thing? Who the heck is Lou Augusta? There's a rumor of empathy. I said, you know, I'm going to go with it because it's an inquiry, an inquiry into what is empathy. There's a rumor of empathy. Let's investigate and see if it has legs. The, I mean, I'm just going to say, I'll give you the wrap up now. Edwin, the rumor of empathy in the culture of empathy is no rumor. Uh, it lives in the work you and all of these colleagues are doing. More substantively, uh, I mean, he, you know, he, here's the shameless self-promotion up front. Let's get that handled, okay? Uh, the, forget about the peer-reviewed books. Here's Empathy, A Lazy Person's Guide. This is the one that's actually selling. And the cool thing about it is it has 24 full-color illustrations by my wife, Alexandra. So if you get tired of reading it, you can look at the pictures. Empathy, a lazy person's guide. Okay, enough, enough of that up front. We act, I'm gonna actually do some work. We're gonna do some work here. Um, and uh, in the face of, I mean, there's a lot of organizational dynamics, you know, the things that make us good at building organizations, at business, solving technical problems, competing with the competition, beating the competition, overcoming legal challenges, overcoming bureaucratic obstacles, you will know. I mean, these things do not necessarily expand our empathy. So what would expand our empathy? Um, I'm, I propose a one-minute empathy training. I'm going to give you, you know, this is like, 
This is not a cliche. I can actually do it in a minute. And then you'll see that there are some conditions and qualifications. So here's the one minute training, empathy training. Get rid of aggression, drive out hostility, drive out bullying, bad language, bad manners, drive out boundary violations, drive out boundary issues, drive out prejudice. In the corporate world, cynicism and resignation are pervasive. Any kind, you get an organization, drive those out, call them out and drive those out. Drive out, in, a, in summary, drive out politics in the negative sense because politics is, is for real, but in the negative sense, get rid of politics and empathy naturally and spontaneously comes forth. People wanna be empathic and will be empathic if given half a chance. So now you can see that that's a big job. I mean, the training is complete and it's not complete, right? Because now the battle is joined. Now the work really gets started. And, but it does give you an idea of the approach to empathy, to expanding empathy, right? I do wanna say one more thing. It's not so much more empathy as expanded empathy. You know how we can feed everybody on the planet earth. Thanks to agribusiness and green revolution and miracle seeds. I mean, there's enough food to go around and people are starving, right? Blockade and all that stuff because of politics. And then likewise with empathy, it sounds like crazy. There's enough empathy to go around. It doesn't seem that way, does it? Empathy is in very short supply on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet there is enough to go around. And so the analogy, I make the analogy there. So in the training itself, whether we work one-on-one -on -one or in group, and here I'm going to, to share, <laughs> I'm gonna to try to share my PowerPoint slide. Um, let's see, share screen, right? Okay, here we go. We've got, ladies and gentlemen, we've got the technology. We're going to work backwards here. If you look at empathy breakdowns, if, you, if one engages to remove the obstacles to empathy and the resistance to empathy, then you actually get something like a capacity for empathizing. And so, I mean, these are not the only breakdowns, but these are the big four. These are, the, I mean, I think this maps to what a lot of the other colleagues were saying, but in somewhat different ways, right? So how empathy breaks down, fails, and misfires. And this also, and I mean, one should be skeptical. Somebody comes along and says empathy is so great. One may usefully be a bit, I mean, one has to be ready to answer the skeptics. So what's so great about this thing? Well, it can fail and it can go off the rails. And here's how you get it back on the rails when that happens. There's a lot of people who roll up the misfirings of empathy into the definition of empathy so that they can dismiss it. Right. I mean, the second colleague on the call was saying how Australia was supposedly the second most unempathic nation on the planet. Well, what was the first one? I don't know. I mean, I don't need to know at the moment. I'm thinking the United States of America. I don't know. Uh, you know, we're sh certainly on the short list. Right. So here are the big four empathy misfirings this one i mean i'm committed to empathy and it goes off the rails i'm listening to a person who's very anxious i'm getting anxious emotional contagion right i mean this is you know there's things that there's skills that will address that but that's the first way i mean emotional contagion is the first way and yet it's a fundamental capacity to dial it up and dial it down. That's the skill. We're naturally empathic. We feel what we feel. I mean, we feel we're in the environment. We feel the emotion. So the, the, the training there is to work on dialing it up and dialing it down. Um, let's see, going around in the circle in any direction, empathic interpretation misfires as projection. I mean, this is the folk definition of empathy. Take a walk in the other person's shoes. And don't forget to take off your own shoes, right? Rarely is it pointed out that I'm taking a walk in your shoes. I may usefully take off my own shoes first. I mean, it's the metaphor to see how the shoe fits. And so projection, mind reading is a, is a valuable and an important skill. And don't forget to take off your own shoes before trying on to see where the shoe fits. Um, so 
lots to be said about that, but I'm going to keep moving on. Let's go across uh, to empathic understanding. So jump across. Uh, if you're looking at the slide, it's on the left side. Empathic understanding misfires as conformity. So you know how sometimes you get so much agreement, you can't cut through it. Everybody shows up being so agreeable. And by the way, agreement is important. And when you agree, be sure to agree. But I got to tell you, starting a meeting, give me some disagreement to get traction. Do you see what I'm saying? A lot of, it's, it's a specific breakdown of empathy to provide conformity. And there's a, there's a conversation to be had here about nonconformity and labeling and categorization. I think that that is not sufficiently recognized, that there is a moment in an empathic relationship when I get who is the other person as a possibility. It seems like the, you know, the organization, I mean, you can take it up a level, the organization or the individual are struggling, they're in breakdown, nothing is working right. Who One are minute. We Thank you, Edwin. Who are we as a possibility? So, you know, I got three out of four and that's pretty good. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. You know, I'm going to actually, I suppose I should say, let's see if I can. Um, what I do want to say at the back end here is that I acknowledge your empathy. You guys have been listening. So you're providing the empathy. I acknowledge you for that. And I want, I also will say that the rumor of empathy is no rumor in the work that Edwin and all of the colleagues on this call is doing. And I acknowledge your empathy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lou. And if we could stop the screen share. Ah, there. Good to see you've been at this a long time. So thanks for all your, your work and persistence, fellow persistence uh, on this. So on this work. So our next speaker is uh, Wendy Williams. If we could bring Wendy up on the screen. And there you are. Great. Yeah. Welcome, Wendy. And uh, so... You're, you're from wendywilliams.com, uh, your website. Uh, you're an empathy speaker, workshop facilitator, and professor and author. And so you have the floor. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. What a privilege to be a part of this group of intelligent people doing wonderful work. So I would like to introduce myself first. I am a professor. I work in the Honors College at TCU and I'm an author. You can see I'm sitting there somewhat proudly with my book that sits in libraries and not on um, <laughs> nightstands. <laughs> it's a very academic work. Um, but in that book, there is um, there's a chapter on sympathy and that is where the beginning of my interest in empathy um, sprung from. And sympathy in the 19th century, which is my area of specialization, um, the word empathy didn't exist back then. And people use the word sympathy to mean what we um, call empathy today. So that's the beginning of my interest. I started a class at TCU um, about 10 years ago on empathy. And we, the students and I, look at empathy from a variety of uh, disciplines and uh, neuroscience, neuroscience light, because I'm not a scientist, um, psychology, sociology, literature, how literature makes us more empathic, um, and so on. And um, there's a service learning component of this class. And I get students out into the community and they connect with people who are different from themselves. So we've worked with um, most recently the um, organization that um, helps asylum seekers and the students um, cannot help but um, try to get into the lives of the people that they become intimately involved with over the course of a semester. Over the pandemic, I had to stop teaching this class because I couldn't send students out into the community. And so I started a consulting business so I could continue with the empathy um, teaching in the world. And um, so that's what I'm doing now. And uh, this is basically an overview of my training. Um, and I work with organizations, institutes, higher education organizations. And we uh, go through what empathy is and why it's essential, self-awareness, awareness of others, which is communication in and out of conflict. 
And then the next steps, what does this mean for us? And I work with leaders and I work with teams. So it's a little bit different approach for depending on who the audience is. So what is empathy? Um, we all have so many definitions of empathy and, um, and so do all the disciplines. So my students love the what is empathy unit in our class because it's so confusing. There are a million different definitions of empathy. Nobody can decide what it is. There's no consensus. So my definition of empathy is um, perspective seeking, not perspective taking, but perspective seeking, because I don't believe that we can take the perspective of others, we can only attempt to do so or take a step in that direction. And so why? The why of empathy in the work world, if, well, here's the research and Anita um, talked about this a little bit too, but since the pandemic, this is what we see. Um, employees say their mental health has declined. They feel like they do not belong and they're disengaged. And they believe empathic leadership increases loyalty, job satisfaction, and many people, especially in Gen X, will intentionally look for a place that demonstrates empathy when they're seeking um, a position. Um, this is important to the C-suite. Uh, the top 10 most empathetic companies generate more earnings. So that's interesting for um, companies, less so for me. I'm really more interested in um, alleviating suffering and bringing about the ability to connect on an individual level. So that's part one, introduction. What is empathy and why do we need it? Part two is probably the most important part of my training. It's um, understanding self. So this is intrapersonal work. And then part three is interpersonal work. So self-awareness, what is it? And um, you, can, you can read the definition. I think you're all aware of what self-awareness is. This is the interesting fact. Everybody thinks they're self-aware, but only 10 to 15 percent of people are, according to some research. So understanding mindset, um, I do this, um, this activity with uh, participants, and we really find out what our core values, core fears, and our positive and negative coping strategies are. So the idea is to really understand what's going on. Who am I? before we start thinking about who other people are. So if I understand that I value um, one thing and somebody else values something different, then maybe what they say to me is rubbing up against my values. And that's why I'm feeling a certain way, right? And then maybe it could be fear-driven the way that I'm reacting to somebody. Maybe somebody is triggering a fear of mine. And so I could be coping in a positive or negative way. So we explore um, understanding our own mindsets. And then once we understand, we work on shifting our mindsets. First, we, we talk a lot about negativity bias. I think that most people know that we are, um, we are hardwired to be negative, to think negatively. We're Velcro for negative events and we're Teflon for positive events. And this is just evolutionary. We are all hardwired this way. So what do we do with all of the negativity that comes into our brains? So we are making negative assumptions very regularly. What causes this? Well, we're creating self-protective stories. And there's binary thinking when we do this. I'm right, you're wrong. I'm the victim, you're the perpetrator. My virtue is magnanimous. Your fault is terrible and big. And we justify ourselves and we blame others. And this is just what humans do. So there are some antidotes to negativity, common humanity. What do we share in common? And we'll do an exercise to find what we have in common. Maybe we have similar fears. Maybe we have similar um, values. Another antidote to negativity is giving people the benefit of the doubt, assuming that other people are doing the best they can with the skills and information they have. And this is the most controversial part of the training because people always have a what if, what about this? What if this? Um, and so we do talk about, you know, when to, when to allow people to, um, to come into our space and when to draw boundaries. But nevertheless, even if people are behaving badly, crossing our boundaries, we can still give them the benefit of the doubt. And here's where the alleviation of suffering is most poignant. If we give other people the benefit of the doubt, it relieves our suffering. Maybe it will help us connect with that other person, but it's most helpful to us. And then gratitude mindset. 
Um, this is a third antidote to negativity and learning how to shift our mindsets. So we understand what's going on in our minds, understanding mindset, shifting mindsets, and then there are various strategies. Mindfulness is a great one too um, um, that I don't use in my training and I have a separate whole training for that that I also teach um, to the college students. So this is the middle part of um, the training, self-awareness. And then once we understand what's going on in our minds, and how to shift outwards toward other people, then we can work on the interpersonal work. And that is all about communication and awareness of other people. So we first talk about communication out of conflict. When everything is okay, we establish those bonds. We develop trust. Psychological safety is created in, this, in these moments when there's no conflict. We can come together. And so we do a lot of work on how to build that trust, how to build relationships, and listening, listening skills are the key. And then we do communication in conflict. So when we're in conflict, our, our um, heart rate is going a little bit faster. Maybe our, our ears are burning, we get a headache, things happen in our bodies and we're less able to communicate well. And so this is, this is the hardest part of empathy. It is really, um, it, it is taking a pause <laughs> breathing, and then engaging in a really intentional way while doing all of the work that we did with shifting mindset, giving the other person the benefit of the doubt, for example. So some examples of what this work looks like is um, learning about shift response versus support response. So I'm asking questions. I am not going to shift the conversation to myself. I'm going to support shift response is, oh, that happened to me too, or if I were you, a support response gets more information. So this, one is, minute. this is one example of how we develop relationships out of conflict. And then here's another um, um, example of things that we do um, to develop relationships out of conflict. This is how we communicate. We avoid communication killers. Um, we use problem solving language when we are uh, especially when we're in conflict so that we don't put other people on the defensive. That is a summary of the training that I do. Part four is next steps and what that looks like. Um, I'll show you results in just a minute. Um, why should we care? Only 24% of employees feel their organization cares about their well-being. So um, I wanted to share some recent research. I'm working with the Institute for Behavioral Research and these were our goals. These are the, this, these are the surveys that we did. And um, after working on empathy skills, this is what the people who work there um, decided that they believe. So the numbers all went up um, and they believe that they feel a sense of teamwork and belonging that they did not have before. So this is my goal with working with students and with people um, in institutes and organization. And um, I loved learning from all of you, would love to stay connected. Uh, thanks so much to Edwin and to all of you for this wonderful opportunity. Muted, there we go. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. This is a new connection, so really glad to connect with you uh, in the empathy world. So thank you for that presentation. We have our next speaker, uh, Jeff Bell. If we could bring Jeff up on the screen, pin him. Uh, hi, Jeff. Uh, welcome. You're a freelance trainer at Empathetics uh, Inc., and you're an author, speaker, and advocate aiming to empower. So the floor is yours. Well, Edmund, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. So let me might um, I might start by saying what a great job you're doing keeping us on track and the clock. That's amazing. It's 10 o'clock on my clock here. Um, I would like to salute all of you for the work that you're doing to bring together this empathy community and thank all of you for sharing so powerfully and candidly about the work that you're doing today as well. As Edwin mentioned, my name is Jeff Bell. I am a facilitator for Empathetics. It's a wonderful organization that I'm very proud to be a part of, and I'm going to be sharing a lot of background about what it is all about. But first, I want to give you a little bit of my backstory, because I think it's very relevant to our topic today and specifically how I came to be working with the founder of Empathetics, Dr. Helen Reese. Let me get my slides. Here we go. So the guy on the far left of the screen right there is me, a lot less gray and many years ago. But as you might gather from that slide, 
Um, I made my career for many, many years, about 30, behind a microphone working as a radio news anchor, most of that time at KCBS in San Francisco. For a long stretch of my career, I was living an elaborate double life. The guy on the radio sounded pretty normal, um, and, but unbeknownst to not only my listeners, but my coworkers, I was battling severe and debilitating OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And so I was doing things like driving our news van in circles, checking for people I might have run over, over and over again. I was getting caught in the bathroom at work um, as I tried to get away from the sink where I could scrub my hands over and over again because I wasn't convinced I didn't carry Ebola or some, or some other nasty disease unknowingly. Um, my life continued to spiral out of control until about 1997 when I found myself in this backyard hammock up in uh, Sacramento where I was living at the time. And I remember lying in that hammock and, and, and making what I've come to call my bargain with the universe. And what I shouted out in no particular to no one in particular was this, show me how to turn around my crazy life and I'll share my story with anyone who will listen. I remember thinking at the time, where did that come from? Um, but it was something pent up deep inside of me. And I waited for a couple of days and the mighty universe did not send down a little instruction book as to how to make my life come back together again. But I put the proverbial cart before the horse, and without identifying it as such, I identify what I've come to call a greater good goal. I decided I was going to share my story of getting better from OCD so other people could benefit. Only one small problem, I had no success story to share. So what I did was I went about journaling a year of my life with living with OCD and living this elaborate double life. And lo and behold, with a lot of professional help along the way, um, I was able to turn around my life over the course of that one year, and I spent another nine years writing and rewriting what would become Rewind, Replay, Repeat, my, my memoir that I published in 1997. And the fascinating thing about this is when I went public and started sharing my story, the more I shared my story, the more I advocated for other people, the more I found that my own recovery continued to move in the right direction. And I came across this principle that we help ourselves by helping others, something that all of you in the empathy world know so very well. That led to a second book, When in Doubt, Make Belief, in which I explored some of the science behind not only empathy, but service and purpose and resilience. And through that work, I came to network with a number of people who were doing what I've called, come to call adversity-driven advocacy across all kinds of different adversity arenas. Cancer survivors helping other cancer survivors, people with mental illness helping others with mental illness. And in Putting together some of that work, we decided to put together a nonprofit organization called A2A. And that is how I came to know Dr. Helen Reese through a mutual friend. She helped me understand the role of empathy in this entire process, which is this. When we employ our empathy in a way that is of service to others, we develop a sense of purpose that fuels our resilience. And it's one of the universal principles that I've come to admire about empathy and the work that's being done in the empathy community. So when I retired from radio about a year ago, one of the first calls I made was to Dr. Helen Reese and said, I would like to go to work for you in empathetics. So let me tell you a little bit about empathetics. I'm going to start with the official elevator pitch because it best encapsulates what we're all about. Empathetics provides innovative empathy and interpersonal skills training for clinical and non-clinical professionals, leveraging scientifically proven methods that enhance human relationships and makes healthcare more effective and efficient. Our accredited e-learning curriculum, companion workshops, and measurement tools are designed to help organizations improve the patient and provider experience. Impact data demonstrate reduced turnover in clinical and non-clinical staff. Empathy training also decreases malpractice risk, and the courses were developed and tested in a randomized controlled trial at Mass General Hospital by internationally known Harvard psychiatrist and empathy researcher, Dr. Helen Reese. And let me take a little moment here to brag just a little bit about Helen as well. She is a recognized authority on empathy, as many of you know. She's written a wonderful book called The Empathy Effect, and if you have not read it, I strongly suggest that you pick up a copy. There's much to be learned from that. Her TED Talk is phenomenal. It's on its way to attracting more than a million viewers. At this point, I think it's collected about 800,000 views, and uh, Helen has become a sought-after speaker, attracting the attention of all kinds of media organizations around the world. So I think just about anyone in the healthcare world would agree that the field is going through a cultural and financial crisis right now. Too many patients are angry and frustrated. Clinicians are burning out and quitting. 
malpractice claims are rising and patient experience scores are dropping, all of this leading to billions of dollars being lost in the profession itself. So how does empathy in general and empathetics in particular help address this crisis? Well, Dr. Reese made a groundbreaking research discovery and that is empathy can be taught. She has empirically proved that and that is really key for introducing empathy into this field. And when we do introduce empathy into the world of healthcare, employee engagement goes up, employee wellness and healthcare reimbursement and healthcare outcomes and patient experience all improve. Professional burnout, employee turnover and malpractice claims are on the downside. So what we offer specifically through Empathetics are three particular tools, online empathy education courses that bear CME and CEU credits, workshops that support the online coursework and provide a renewed sense of community, and measurement tools to track that impact. All of this is neuroscience-based and empirically driven. We believe that Sutter Health, one of our longtime partners, offers a great example of how we work with healthcare enterprises. We've been working with Sutter for several years. They have a system of 24 hospitals, and you can see some of the improved benefits of our work with their doctors and nurses and frontline staff. We're accredited by a number of major organizations, which we believe makes a huge difference in the healthcare credibility as well. We take all that very seriously. And I wanted to share with you a slide, is kind of a compilation of some feedback that we've gotten from our clients, because we think that they're letting us know that we're hitting the mark by getting hospitals out of the emergency room and back into the business of putting care into healthcare. I think I'm just about out of time, so I will wrap it up there. I want to let you know that we have a website that you can check out for more information. It's empathetics.org. And also, my information is on LinkedIn. I would love to stay in contact with you. And again, I want to thank you. I'm sorry, it's empathetics.com at this point, empathetics.com for more about our work. And again, I want to thank all of you. And Edwin, a special thank you for reaching out to us. We were, we're thrilled to be a part of this summit today. Okay, thank you, uh, Jeff, for taking part. Then we'll pop the uh, screen share on that. You did have another minute if you wanted to say anything else. Just that I'd encourage everybody to check out the website and, and learn more. It's always hard to do justice in, in just 10 minutes to a long time project like this, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to try. And again, I look forward to staying connected via LinkedIn with the rest of you as well. Okay, well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I think it says end of slideshow, click to exit. What is? I will do that as soon as I find there it. There we go, yay. Okay. So I'm going to, in. thank you. Uh, and I'm going to into the chat where if I can find that here, uh, where'd the chat go? We're, we're moving into the next uh, phase of our uh, presentation and we're gonna have one more speaker. And before we go and have the uh, bill come up, I just want you to, I'm putting a, into the chat the link. I hope that I shared to everyone. So welcome to any new participants. Uh, you know, at the top of the hour, some new people may have joined. Uh, if you're leaving early, you can fill out the uh, feedback form, and there's a link to it there. And if you're an Empathy Circle facilitator, uh, if you could add ECF to the front of your name, and if you're okay with being recorded, putting a R in front of your name. We're gonna have one more presentation and then explain how the empathy circle works. And then we'll be going into empathy circles and uh, you'll be able to get a chance of actually doing some empathy uh, practice. And hopefully the, some of the speakers will stay behind and I'm making the, the breakout rooms right now as, as, this, uh, as, uh, as Bill's going to be speaking. So I'm going to introduce uh, Bill Filler uh, uh, next, if we can bring Bill up. And hi, Bill. Uh, my good friend, uh, Bill, we've worked together for a long time. Uh, he's also from the Empathy Center, and he's the Empathy Facilitator Training Co-Developer. So co-developed it with uh, Lou uh, and uh, Swire. And uh, take it away, Bill. And while while you're speaking, do everyone, if you will, um, uh, put the ECF in front of your name so I can create the, the breakout rooms. Okay, thanks, Bill. 
thanks, Edwin. Thanks to all the other presenters. It's really great. Um, what you see behind me is uh, is sort of my uh, Super Bowl. These, this is my my students. Uh, I'm a retired special education teacher, and we went to the beach and to. It looks like a very common, simple thing, but it was actually a great achievement. Um, so, um, as I said, I'm a retired special education teacher. During my career, I worked with some of the most at-risk students. These were students who were in danger of being removed from their homes, going to jail, committing suicide, or causing physical harm or requiring hospitalization. Uh, during my decades of teaching, working with a wonderful multidisciplinary team of administrators, school psychologists, school social workers, and assistants, eight out of 10 uh, students who walked through our classroom door were able to remain with their um, families. While my students were good people, extreme trauma made them fragile. And when stressed, they could act out physically. One of the great learnings of my career occurred when we reviewed one of these events. The team leader asked, what was the communicative intent of that act? Incidents such as these are often spontaneous, chaotic experiences. My initial thought was, what intent? It came out of nowhere. Um, but when we did our research, we found that uh, the students had been fed, they saw physical abuse or physical were physically abused themselves. When we reflected what we had learned about the student's experience and the student felt heard and understood, the violence decreased dramatically. I quickly learned to employ reflective listening techniques to uh, proactively engage with my students. Human cultures across the world and across the centuries have practiced some sort of talking circle. As a result of my experience, I believe that being heard and understood is a basic human need, as important as food, water, or air. Many of us have lost touch with that tradition. The sooner we can re reconnect with that practice, the sooner we can functionally collaborate to overcome the challenges we face. If we can achieve this, we will truly have created a culture of empathy. I met Edwin Rutsch, the originator of the Empathy Circle, approximately six years ago. I quickly realized how the circle practice established a sense of trust and community and wanted to be part of bringing this practice to a needful world. I joined Edwin and Lou Zwire, helping to design the online training, as well as taking the empathy tent to demonstrations on the left and the right in order to get people to listen to each other. And I will share my screen for a second. And just to see, uh, this is at uh, Politicon in 2018. Uh, it was, had people, you could see MSNBC, but on the left and the right. Uh, this is a, a big Trump supporter with Lou and myself. Uh, after a little circle. Uh, this is me. Uh, you can see I, my shirt makes me look very fat. Um, and with policemen, this was a, a demonstration on the right. Uh, this was the Women's March. Um, and that was at an XR uh, climate action. And that's Edwin uh, sharing with, uh, 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 I'm sorry, class at Berkeley. So we see empathic listening as a muscle that needs exercise. And, um, and, and it needs to be couched in the values of empathy, mutuality, care, and openness. Those are our values. There are certainly more that are, you know, that you could add. The empathy circle practice is designed as a simple experiential listening practice that can be shared and spread easily. Its simplicity means that it can be shared between people of different ages, religions, ethnicities, and political affiliations. We don't believe that empathy is something you put in someone. We believe that the circle process reveals the empathic person that is already there. The empathy circle facilitation training is designed to be easily accessible for all. Volunteers offer it for free or on a sliding scale. No one has ever been um, turned away for lack of funds. The training is designed to teach the basic skills couched in our core values in a short, clear manner. It is important as well to give participants the experience of how it feels to be heard and to provide that experience for others. The training is four sessions long. It does not require perfection from the participants. It is designed to allow them to learn at whatever rate or pace me feels comfortable for them. 
To enable this, participants can take the course as many times as they want, reinforcing the basics while taking on challenges as they feel ready for them. Many participants who take the training decide to continue to learn to present the course. They become trainees and after five sessions become trainers. Included in the training are role plays that simulate some of the challenges that one might face as a facilitator, responding instead of reflecting, interrupting and arguing are just some of those. The outcomes we hope to provide are, we want participants to understand and become familiar with the goals, values, and the core structure of the empathy circle so they can guide others through the experience. We want participants to become aware of their strengths and learning edges as a facilitator and to learn to respond to typical challenges that can arise in any empathy circle. We want participants to leave the training have estab having established strong bonds and a sense of community with others. Beyond that, we look to continue to support each other with our training and growth towards building a culture of empathy. We began our empathy circle facilitation training in March of 2020. Our first class consisted of medical personnel in Brooklyn, New York, who were at ground zero of the COVID pandemic. What these brave men and women found was that just five minutes of empathic listening at a shift change could have a pr profound effect on the rest of their day. Since then, we have trained over 600 people from all over the world. We have an upcoming weekly online training starting on uh, Saturday, October 7th, and continuing until October 28th. On the weekend of September 16th and 17th, we will conduct our first in-person training at the Empathy Center in the hills above Santa Barbara. We will shortly announce our training schedule for both the online and in-person trainings for 2024, so look for them. You can contact me and I'll put my information in the chat uh, for more information um, and we invite you to all to enjoy, to join us. Thanks a lot. That's it. Okay, uh, thanks, Bill. So what we're gonna do next is uh, a preparation for the uh, empathy circle. So it's gonna be the participatory part where you actually get to uh, speak with others in, in the group. And before we do that, we're gonna just explain how to do the empathy circle. And we have a, a six minute video clip, which I'm going to share. And that will explain the actual process. And let me see, share sound. And this is it. And here we go. For building a culture of empathy. I'd like to uh, welcome you to this short presentation on how to take part in a basic empathy circle. So next, let's look at uh, the step-by-step -step how to take part. Uh, an empathy start circle starts with two to seven participants. Here on the screen, we have four participants, which I find is an ideal number. There are four basic roles, and the roles rotate among the participants as the empathy circle unfolds. One, the speaker, is the first person to speak. Two is uh, active listener who actively listens to the speaker. There's the silent listeners, they quietly observe and witness. And the facilitator who organizes schedules and hosts the circle. Uh, they also do the timekeeping and they have some experience with the process and help keep participants in the process. However, everyone has the responsibility to hold the, the, the process and the practice. So to begin with, the facilitator will start the empathy circle. They welcome the participants. Uh, they uh, lead introductions if the participants don't know each other. The facilitator invites participants to give short introductions, for example, their name, where they're from, and something personal about themselves. Uh, the facilitator then reviews the empathy circle process to remind everyone uh, how it works. They announce the discussion topic, if there is one. Even if there is a topic, you can always talk about what is alive for you. That is, what is on your mind in the moment. And five, uh, you can, they set the speaker time limits, perhaps uh, five minutes, for example. 
and the facilitator then asks who would like to start the, to be the first speaker. So at that point, the participant volunteers to be the first speaker. As speaker, you select who you will who will be your active listener, and you can select anyone that you want. Uh, you speak about the topic given or whatever is alive for you, and so you'll speak a bit until you have maybe expressed an idea or two, and then you want to pause to give the active listener a chance to recap what they understand uh, that you are saying and feeling. Uh, if you say too much, the listener may have difficulty in reflecting it. As the active listener, you are listening to the speaker to get an understanding of what they are saying and what is important to them. You are giving them your full attention as a supportive companion on their inner journey and exploration. Uh, when the speaker pauses, uh, you recap your understanding of what they said and how they feel by reflecting the essence of that in your own words. Uh, you can summarize, paraphrase, or even say the speaker's words back to them. Even though you may have a strong impulse to respond with your own ideas, judgments, analysis, advice, and sympathy, or, or even questions, you know, resist the impulse to do so. Uh, because uh, uh, these common responses block the speaker from moving along their internal journey. You will be able to say whatever you want when it is your turn to be the speaker. So if you don't reflect the understanding to the speaker's satisfaction, you, they can always say it again. Then as speaker, you check, do you feel understood to your satisfaction? If you do not feel understood, you can say it again, perhaps in different words. Uh, if you do feel understood, continue sharing. Again, after speaking a bit, pause to give your active listener a chance to recap their understanding of what you said. As the active listener, you again share your understanding of what the speaker said and meant. The cycle of speaking and reflecting continues until you as the speaker do not have anything else you'd like to say or until you get a signal from the timekeeper. Uh, if you get a signal from the timekeeper, then finish up what you're saying in a sentence or two. After you get a final reflection, you can end your turn by saying something like, I feel fully heard or something like that to indicate you are done with your speaking turn. At that point, the roles uh, then rotate. The active listener becomes the speaker. The person they select becomes the new active listener. For everyone having equal time, it is good to select someone that hasn't spoken lately, but it is your choice. The others in the circle become the silent listeners. This process of turn taking turns in speaking and active listening continues for whatever time is allotted for the empathy circle. And this was uh, just a very short introduction. The best way to learn the practice is taking part and doing it. Uh, there is more in-depth material on taking part in an empathy circle and facilitating one at empathycircle.com. Thank you for listening. Okay, so just preparing up. Oh, somehow we got uh, Lou highlighted, or is that just me? So gallery view. Um, Edwin, uh, Dr. Golda has her hand up. Uh, yes, yeah, she messaged me. I think she she's just oh. going to be an empathy circle facilitator. So oh, okay. Um, so uh, let's see, I'm going to put the, we're moving into the next, into the breakout rooms. I've created breakout rooms and put six people in each one. And our topic for the discussion I'm putting into the chat is share any feeling and thoughts about the empathy training and what you heard today or whatever's alive for you. So you can always speak about whatever's on your mind. And you're going to have four minute speaking turns. And we have uh, how many rooms here? We have uh, seven rooms, I believe. And we have um, 
a facilitator in each one. So let me, some people have dropped out, so that kind of shifts the rooms around. Let me redo this, move to eight. Just uh, make sure we have enough people in every room. And we're gonna have uh, about an hour and 15 minutes for this part. And uh, one more movement to room four. I think we're all set. One second, two. Yeah, so we're ready for the, for the breakout rooms. We're gonna go into the breakout rooms. Like I said, we have about an hour and 15 minutes in the breakout room where you actually practice the empathic listening and the empathy circle practice, which I find is the best, easiest first step gateway practice for learning empathy. And it's a real ground uh, foundational uh, practice. So here we go. And if you- and the person is, have, Yeah. I'm sorry, is that four minutes? Four minutes speaking turns. Okay. And I, oh, I didn't put it into the full group. I just put, okay, let me put that into the chat. Thanks, Linda. So there's to everyone. Topic, share any feelings and thoughts about empathy training and what you heard today or whatever is on your mind. So it can be anything that's just really, you have energy and are alive, alive for you. And here we go into the rooms. And I'll give like a, a 60 second, a, a 10 minute warning before we close the, the rooms as well. And you'll see people have ECF next to their name, and there may be more than one ECF into a room, but they will be the the one of them will be the uh, facilitator. So here we go into the breakout rooms. Uh, let me double check. This is a lot to juggle here. Right. Okay. Here we go. Open all rooms. And you should be moving into your rooms. Recording. Okay, I don't see that. Okay, great. Um, are there any questions about the uh, process itself? Nope. Okay, great. Um, so what we'll do is that uh, I'll just kind of role, role model it. Uh, I'll be the first speaker. Uh, I mean, sorry, the first listener. Uh, and uh, I invite someone to um, uh, speak who would like to start off. Okay, great. Um, Mayor Alight, is that correct? You're muted, Mayor. You can hear me now? I can hear you now. Did I get your name right, or at least close? Well, <laughs> it's my first and last name together. Oh, okay. It's so, actually Mayor. Mayor, okay, great. Mayor, I'm all ears. Okay, so I have four minutes, is that... What's yeah, going on? Right, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. What's very activated for me is last night, um, I heard, I live in a senior facility in Seattle, Washington, and in the alley behind where I live on the third floor, I heard six shots fired, gunshots. And I... <laughs> I called 911 uh -huh. immediately to have a um uh get a, someone on the scene. I didn't hear any voices. Usually I hear in the evenings I hear shouting, arguing, conflicts, whatever's going in in the alley and um I heard nothing. No people, no words, just these six shots fired. And it was a uh, a uh, triggered a post-traumatic stress uh, incident for me because when my child was about two years old, I was living on a houseboat and I heard shots fired and it was someone being killed in the boat next to me. So that whole uh, scenario came back instantly to me and I'm grateful for the work I have been doing on myself the last half a century. <laughs> So I'm 73 now. 
And um, so I was able to be present, find myself back into the room, call 911, and then make other calls and see uh, if the building was secure, was it locked, were people going in and out, what was going on there, so that I could feel safe and have a sense of protection. So I'm just okay. going to stop there. Sure. Um, so uh, what's really working you is that you had see, heard six shots behind you live in the senior center and you heard six shots and um, that um, you called 911. Um, you, usually you hear some conversation or you're yelling and arguing. There was nothing, just six shots. And what really uh, brought this back is some PTSD um, that when you were, when your son was two, you were living on a boat and then someone was shot, you heard a shot and somebody was killed in the boat next to you. And you've been doing a lot of work through the decades um, to really work on that. And I, I sense, and I'm inferring here, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I sense a, um, a, a, an inner strength that rather, you know, you were able to react, call 911, find out whether people were, you know, everybody was okay, and actually did a lot of practical things to really um, help the situation. Did I miss anything? Thank you. That was quite uh, complete for me. Uh, the one thing I would add there is that the uh, well, if I add, then I'd be going on to more things. So I'll stop and say I feel fully hurt. Okay, you feel fully hurt. Okay. And I realize I didn't say what my feelings or needs were in there, so I'd like to add those. Okay, well, go ahead quickly. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my feelings uh, were shock and uh, fear and uh, co co the confusion of the trail back to the other incident, making sense of it by how I know to look at the room and figure out what room I'm in and how I'm present and connect to what's important in the moment, which is to take action uh, in case someone's bleeding to death. So I was appreciating my needs for um, the, the support, the taking action as support and contribution for everyone in the senior home um, to increase a sense of safety. And yeah, that was important to me. Okay. So I'm congratulating myself on that. <laughs> ability to do that. <laughs> well, congratulate you too. <laughs> um, so what I'm hearing is that the feelings you were shock, fear, um, confusion, but you overcame that in order to take action and to create safety and support for the people who, who lived in the senior center and you're giving yourself a big hug. Everybody can give themselves a big hug. It can never be too much. And uh, uh, and a job well done. I'm sorry, I broke the rules a little bit there, but uh, <laughs> I kind of felt that that was a natural ending there. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, Dr. Natalie, are you ready to listen? Yes. Okay. Oh, um, so... Uh, what would um, what really is working with me when you talk about empathy training is um, is this this kind of realization that I've had is that empathy is inherent in us. I'll stop there. Can you reflect that? You, I'm sorry, you want me to, I, I'm not sure how this works. You want me to- Oh, okay. That's okay. You want to see it role model to something else? That'd be great. Okay, sure. No problem. Uh, Lou, could you- uh... Yeah, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll try. Okay. I mean, what, what, what I get, yeah, is like, is it, am I born with it or- you know, I get that's a different different than what you said, but you know, do I right. bring empathy to the game? Uh, you know, innately, so to say. 
Right, that's not. something there. Uh, yeah. Noam Chomsky came up with the language acquisition device. <laughs> and <Okay>. backed by <laughs> absolutely no research that I am aware of, I would say that we're born with an empathy acquisition device. Hmm. I'll stop there. Um, no, we pause for a moment to honor Noam Chomsky, who you name, and he has the idea of a language acquisition device. And maybe, just maybe, or more than maybe, I think you, you know, you credit yeah. this as, as a valid assertion, that there's an empathy acquisition device. Yeah. Um, uh, there are various other things, you know, other things that we live in a doggy dog world, zero sum stuff like that. But when I studied evolution, actually, the only reason that humans are as successful as a species as they were, um, or as we are, that could open to debate, is uh, the fact that we could collaborate and cooperate. And I'll stop there. Well, human beings, when we when we're able to to get things to work, it's because we have this ability to collaborate. I mean, another word for that might be cooperate. And all of this is taking place in a in a context of a it's a doggy dog world. And I think the song says it's a doggy dog world and only the strong survive. <laughs> and it's a zero sum game. I mean, so that's what I got. And so um and so it's, I could, yeah, that's what I got. It, it cooperation and 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 this this uh, specialization of being able to work together is very helpful. Right. And in my job, I worked with a lot of um, psychopathology and dysfunction and mm -hmm. violence and things like that. And so, but I came to realize, or at least my epiphany was that these kids weren't acting out because that's essential to their nature. These yeah. kids were acting out because they hadn't received empathy. Mm -hmm. And they there's something inside us that knows that that's really what we should be doing. And when we don't receive that, then we get upset and act out. I'll stop there. When you, when you don't get enough empathy, things don't go well. Mm -hmm. People start, I mean, kids in particular, young folks, where it's what your, you know, your work. Mm -hmm. um, when empathy is missing, people misbehave in in problematic ways, and it can show up as even violence and psychopathology. And and what's it's not that there's something wrong. It's not like the kids are essentially bad. I mean, right. it's what I, I heard you say something to that effect. No, no, no. It's this bad behavior is a reaction to, I mean, there's not, what's missing is empathy. And I could go somewhere with that, but I think I won't. Oh, okay. Did I get that right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, and then also Michelangelo talked about it um, when he talked about sculpting. He said, you know, they said, well, how do you do this beautiful, you know, P.A. Ta and David? And he goes, he says, I'm not trying to create the sculpture. I don't see the sculpture. I just take away everything that's not the sculpture. I just eliminate. And I think that that's what um, we try to do in the circle is to um, give people an experience and they sort of, uh, a lot of their preconceived notions fall away and so then they 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 see the beautiful sculpture that's within them mm. i'm done thank you well you so you're basically an empathy sculpture like michelangelo <laughs> remember that guy who the the statue david david and goliath mm. i mean you're 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 dealing with a lot of <laughs> This adds a little to what, but you, this is in what you said. You've got all these kids running around who are kind of misbehaving or, you know, they're at risk. This is, is, is the phrase. And you take a, you, you see the sculpture in the marble. It looks like the kid is a, is a rough piece of marble, you know, hacked off a mountain. It's not, not beautiful. It's ugly even. You didn't use that word, but, and you see the, the, you see the, this the beautiful sculpture David in the kid, and you remove 
I'm thinking some of the bad behavior. You add a little empathy. I mean, you know, you got the chisel, the hammer and chisel, and you chisel away. So, and now, then you got David, which is like a, a you know, it's a, it's a very great work of art, to say the least. So you actually are an empathy artist. No, well, thank How you. How am I doing? Great. <laughs> I feel fully heard. It's your turn to speak. Take a listen. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, so this is for me, I'll just talk about what the experience. Pick a listener, been. Though, so, so pick a listener. So somebody will ah, pick a listener. Well, who's I mean, who's who's ready? I mean, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. I noticed Dr. Nicole Price. Are you there, Dr. Price? I Break am. I, I am here. OK. And and I, I acknowledge your excellent uh, publicity photo. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you it's not necessary to see you, but, you know, the protocol so far is you'd like turn the camera on if you're not in your jammies. Maybe <laughs> you're... I, in about six minutes, I'll be able to turn my camera. I on. see you may be in transit. I get it. You're in transit. I'm guessing. OK, so no yes. problem. You'll listen. I'll talk. It'll be great. Um, OK, but what I'm present to, what's going on for me, after those first two presentations, I was taking a few notes. I'm like, I'm really like, I got some work to do <laughs> to, to get this empathy training going. I'm experiencing, um, you know, the, the real, the thing that's missing in my life is that my name is not Mimi Nicklin or Leanne Butterworth, the first two speakers, whose presentation was really polished. I don't know if you were on the call for that. You might have been, you know, laying on an airplane or something. But it was like, you know, I mean, leaving, don't worry about the PowerPoint, but it was what I was impressed by is Mimi's getting people to tell their stories. And there's trauma and struggle and, and happiness too, I think. But, you know, usually the bad stuff comes out first. I, I'm getting a message, which I didn't get that. Tell me again. Oh, Am I Just remember to pause so that the, uh, so okay. the listener doesn't have to ah, read. I'm on a roll here. Thank you. Okay. So that's as far as, I mean, there's a lot there. And this is the advanced course. I'm going to be quiet. That's as far as I got. Yeah. So here's what I heard. You were so inspired by the first two speakers uh, today that you feel that you have much more work to do. Um, and you were curious to know if I had an opportunity to see them and their presentations. And, um, and it sounds like you're just comparing a little bit your work to theirs, but you're excited about what they present. Well, th th thank you, you got it. And, th and that's the tough part that I'm a little reluctant to share. I mean, because I, I mean, I'm, I have to give my, after listening to them, I had to give myself a pep talk. <laughs> Lou, you're good at this thing. You know what you're doing. And why do you give yourself a pep talk? Because I wasn't feeling that good. <laughs> yeah, I was feeling like I need, I got a lot of work to do here. What you got, Lou, is like, you know, it's not ready for the big leagues. It's good, but it's not ready for the big leagues. And so that was somewhat confronting. I'll stop, I'll pause. I got it. So um, again, um, once you put what you feel about your work next to what you felt about the first two presenters' presentations and work, you then had to renew your own confidence in yourself uh, to prepare for your presentation. Very good. Thank you. You got it. Um, I could go on with this because it was like this with almost every speaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, so I, th I feel heard. I feel heard. Thank you for listening, Dr. Price. Uh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much, Lou. Okay, Dr. Price, if you're in uh, able to, then you're the next speaker and you pick a listener. Is, is it okay? I still have like two minutes until I can turn my camera on. Is that okay? Yeah, you, yeah, that's okay. Is, is, if you feel comfortable speaking, please go ahead. Okay. And um, would you help me choose a speaker? Uh, oh, sure, sure. Uh, Dr. Uh, Petowoff, Huff, and I apologize in advance for butchering your name. <laughs> the no, you did great. You did great. Thank uh, you. Are you ready to listen like, now? Do you feel comfortable? Yeah, it's like uh, pet a dog, but pet a hoff. Pet a hoff. Got it. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so, Dr. Price, you can listen to Dr. Uh, Dr. Petahoff will listen to you. 
So go ahead. Thank you so much, Bill, for helping me pick. Um, I will say that what is really on top for me and being in the uh, summit is really that I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to join. Uh, too many times the empathy circles um, just conflict with uh, work that I'm doing. So I haven't had an opportunity since Anita Nowak um, had invited me to the empathy circles. And so it's just nice to see um, that there are so many incredibly smart people attacking empathy from a lot of different ways. And I'll pause there. So what I heard you say, Dr. Price, is that um, you're grateful that you were able to join because up until now, your schedule has conflicted and that you felt grateful for being invited, but maybe a little disappointed that you hadn't been able to attend previously because of schedule and that you, it's uh fascinating to see how many different facets there are of empathy and how different speakers are representing that in the world yes that's excellent thank you very much for that recap and i'll also say um that even today i feel just slightly out of sorts because my way is to be on camera and to be all engaged and making comments and cheering people like lou on it's like you're doing a great job I already bought his book even, um, the one about lazy empathy. I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, and so I don't know. I just don't, I think I don't like the appearance that I'm not all in. And it feels like, it feels like I'm not all in when I'm, I'm totally engaged in listening. Just, yeah. So what I heard you say, Dr. Price, is that you're feeling um disappointed in not being able to be fully engaged because your normal uh, way of being is to uh, be a cheerleader and to uh, support others and that that that's how you'd normally like to show up that's correct and then I think my my final uh, thing that's still on top for me is that um Many of the people I am engaging with um, are almost afraid of empathy. And I, I mean that word intentionally. They think empathy is the enemy of accountability and productivity and all those. And so I'm still looking for um, something that I feel will help to get people to be a little more curious about this concept that I know has been just so impactful in my own life um, and I know um, can drive better outcomes for people. So Dr. Price, what I heard you say is a bit of frustration because you're experiencing people being afraid of something that you have found valuable in your own life, something that you find very powerful and that it's frustrating that they have a blind spot and you're searching for how to help them see something they can't see at least just not yet and at this point I think I feel very seen and heard okay Dr. Petahoff it's your turn to be speaker and pick a listener um how about mayor So for me, uh, the summit today was uh, an affirmation of the concept of empathy and its importance. Um, in 2019, I started a book, and so it was before the pandemic, and it was my gut feel that it was an important thing. Um, and so it's just fascinating to see uh, the validation of that through so many other people's eyes. So I'll reflect that part. Um, what I heard there was that um, there was something really important to you that you started this book and it was before the pandemic. And then now what you're seeing is how many other people also are 
I don't remember the words you said, like with you in this perspective. And that's uh, some way uh, validating, I think, maybe a sense of companionship or something like that. Yes, I thank you for that. I um I'm, I when I started the journey on the book, I was really curious why and looked for my own story of origin around empathy. Mm-hmm. And I think at that time I didn't fully understand my own desire or reasoning for writing a book and and the book is the book's audience is mostly corporate America, but it applies to every, everyone and everything. And so what I got from today was um, a bit of insight into my own story of origin. So when you started the book, it wasn't clear to you, like, what was what was uh, motivating or inspiring you to focus on this empathy? What was your own story of origin, personal? And your audience, as you were writing the book, was corporate America. It could apply to anyone, everyone. And yet, through the process of this particular empathy summit, the speakers have given you more insight, more understanding about your own personal story. Did I did I get that? You did. That's perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. That's that's very good. And I think um it's to me it's fascinating when you have a gut feel that something's important. And sometimes we can discount that internal feeling or not follow it but I was so driven on this pursuit. And so I'm just self-reflecting on my own discernment and ability to see something and to follow it without really, because I'm a type A, got to know the end result type person that I followed it despite not completely understanding my own, my own desire for understanding it or the impact that it, that studying this and talking about it could and might have. And today's summit brought that to the forefront to see how incredibly important this concept is in actually changing the world as we know it. There's a lot there for me. I'm I, I know. very, very rich. In a, so I'll in a very see deep place today. If I, what, what I'm hearing happened for you, and tell me if I'm off on this, what I'm hearing happen is you were driven by something within you that would not be uh, discounted, that you were right there. Yes, I'm doing this. I'm motivated without the clarity of what was actually motivating you. So as you're, you you were intent on writing this book, reaching corporate America, changing the world, and what was the, the core motivating factor for you wasn't quite clear. But you were aware that there was, this is the part about, that you had this um, urge or this impelling from within, you're doing this without totally understanding it. So as you're listening to this summit and what people are saying, it's becoming more clear what that, like the the, the driving, I don't remember what words you use, the driving or motivating force, the inspiring force you, it's inside you <laughs> and you are, we're listening to it sort of unawares of the motivating part, but clear that it was saying do, 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 do. And now you're not do, 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 do. And you're, you're getting that, the action. And now you're, you're, the summit is helping you to fully or more completely or increasingly understand yourself. 
I might. <laughs> and I'll, I'll say one last thing. I think I've been through a lot of transition in the last year, year and a half, um, writing a book in an organization where I was kind of protected for a while. And then when I integrated back into the culture was verbally abused and bullied by some of the executives. And so it was just an interesting juxtaposition to write a book about empathy, to be bullied in a corporation by executive behavior and ultimately to be laid off, even though I co-authored it with the CEO. So it, there's so many juxtapositions there that I think that I lost my purpose. And I'm very grateful for being in this community to help me reconnect with that impetus that I had inside of me to redirect that sadness to, to find myself again. I'm pausing to take this all in. Um, so what I was hearing was a real stress and distress that you were somehow working with the CEO, that there was a way that you were sheltered and allowed to do this work. And then <laughs> the shift from, oh, well, no empathy. And as a matter of fact, the experience of being bullied and stressed on and ultimately fired or laid off or whatever word you said, no longer with who you were writing, co-authoring this with about empathy, how <laughs> disconcerting. And uh, what is that called? Um, um, the dissonance between what you're writing about and the experience you receive. What? And so you, I think you said something about losing your, your impulse or your impetus for being connected with your purpose and that that shift and dissonance is being um, now supported as you're finding where it is warm and safe and empathic to be in community with other people with a shared purpose. Yes. Without Thank cognitive you. dissonance <laughs> between yes. experience and reality and yeah. Yes. Thank you. I feel very heard and complete. That's my way of doing cosseting. This is my cosseting. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Mayor, your speaker and choose a listener. Me? Yeah. You're the speaker. The active listener becomes the next speaker. Oh, but didn't I already speak? Everyone has had a chance right now. Everybody, we've gone around the circle. Oh, whoa. Okay. Yes. Four minutes of. For uh, this exercise, I'll choose something that's not quite as. But pick a listener first. Oh, pick a listener. Who would I like to listen to? Me. Uh, Dr. Natalie, I would love to have you listen to me. All right. All right. My pleasure. Oof. I'm in the middle in the part of forming a team with a new launch of something that I'm calling the Withing Way. And uh, my students have now become my te team members, wanted to support the Withing Way and uh, and me and the Withing Way in 
reaching more people. And uh, there's now a team of, uh, I'm losing count. I think it's five. It could be six <laughs> oh, people. I'm really excited about this process. So I heard you say, Mayor, that you're you're starting a new uh, a new venture, and that your um, your group is starting to form and norm, and that you're excited about that. Yes, yes, and uh, thank you for hearing that. I'm. I'm doing my best to not do what is not in my wheelhouse and to do that which I feel comfortable and competent and confidence about, which is empathy. So what I heard you say is that, and I'm inferring here, that you're selectively choosing things that are in your wheelhouse that are truly your expertise and perhaps um, not trying to do it all yourself, that you're allowing the team members to support you and allowing yourself to shine in the part that you're really good at versus having to do the whole thing and your faith and trust in others is allowing you to do this. Ooh, all but that last part, because the faith and trust I have in others is my area, uh, my growing edge to trust that other people, I just rather do it myself. I'm a serial <laughs> entrepreneur and I just rather do things myself because then I know they're done right. The way I want them is what I mean by right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what I heard you say is that in the past, perhaps, that as a serial entrepreneur, which means you're successful, um, oh. that's my interpretation of that, um, that often you felt the need to take it on yourself because you have a expectation of how things should be done or could be done and and perhaps inferring here that maybe sometimes people don't always show up or participate fully and so there's a bit of distrust maybe from disappointment or frustration and so you've now in this new endeavor taken a leap of faith because doing it all is tiresome and nearly impossible and that it would feel wonderful if you could trust other people to show up and to to show up for themselves and to show up for you and to allow you to not have to do it all and to show up and shine in your area of expertise. Ah, uh, yes, the time. I saw that little time marker. So I'm gonna stop and say thank you very much for your, for your uh, hearing me. You're very welcome. Okay, and Dr. Um, Pedahoff, um, your speaker and choose a listener. Okay, how about Dr. Price? My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so I wanna go back to the topic of purpose. Um, I have never not known my purpose. I have never not been able to set a goal. I have never 
not knowing, not known where I was going and what I was aiming to accomplish. Doesn't mean I always accomplished it. And so this past year and a half has been really scary because I am living in not knowing and I'm really not good at that. Okay. So here's what I hear. <clears throat> You've always had direction, knowing what you're here for, designed to do, what your goals are and where all that's going to take you even if you didn't see it to fruition. And so being in this space for the last year and a half has been unsettling because for the first time in your life, uh, many of those things are unknown. Yes. And I'm experiencing um, what I found fascinating, like kind of, I don't know, doing a Woody Allen and being, you know, on the ceiling, looking down at me um, and doing some self-reflection. My reaction to that was depression versus I'm going to show them. Okay. And normally I would be, I'm going to show them, but this I think the cognitive, the level of cognitive dissonance triggered something very deep that I hadn't processed. And so because it was buried, my soul chose depression to help me maybe search for that. Mm -hmm. So when you take an objective view and look at this from the outside in, your assertion is that before you had this experience with the CEO, you would have been resilient. The rejection would have fueled your energy, passion, and commitment to show them what could be. Um, however, this time, you think that there's some past trauma that was deeply buried, that was triggered. And the emotion you felt has been depression. And I feel, I'm trying not to feel depressed about being depressed. <laughs> I feel like I just wasted a year and a half of time. Um, Like, and, and similar to Lou, I feel like I have so much to offer, but I'm behind, right? And so I'm comparing, which I know is not the, you should never compare, but I'm comparing, I'm comparing and I'm feeling disappointed in myself that I didn't identify the trigger and the level of hurt and pain and connect it so that I could rise above it faster to get back on it. Okay, tell me if this is not right. <clears throat> I don't like how depression feels, so I want to speed through it and be over with it and done. <laughs> I just, yeah, yes. And I... I'm regretful for, instead of appreciating the process of being human and how we process emotions, I have an expectation that I should have been able to identify, work through it and get on with it. And so I am feeling at a loss for how not to feel disappointed in myself that it took this long. So my primary emotion is I feel disappointed because my accuser says I should have seen this coming. And if I didn't see it coming, I at least should have been able to make some connections to help me understand what was happening during that year and a half and be able to jumpstart that process and be on with it. Yes. 
Thank you. I feel seen and heard and complete. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I, I get to speak, right, Bill? Yep. Now, what I did, I think I might have missed this. Bill, can you be a listener or no? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll be your listener. I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, I was like, I think Bill was listening to somebody. Uh, so what's on top for me is I feel this incredible urge to like be there for some of these things I'm hearing. <laughs> I um I found I I often say that I'm the worst person to talk about empathy because I was the person that everybody was trying to fix prior to you know the last few years or so. Um and beautiful people don't just happen. Uh, sometimes there you need a, an experience um that causes you to be better at the empathy thing. So um yeah, I, I know some kind of wonderment at your own situation. Um, and you said that um, you didn't you didn't feel like you were the best person for empathy and that sometimes beautiful people um, are not just, you know, um, spontaneously combusted from the ether, but uh, they have to have an experience in order to evolve and grow. And I'm, I missed the first the very first thing you said, I think. Oh, which was just that, <clears throat> you know, when I hear Lou saying he's comparing, when I hear mm -hmm. uh, Mayor say that, oh, you know, I don't, I don't trust these people to be able to do it. When I hear uh, Dr. Uh, Petterhoff say, oh gosh, I, I feel depressed and I'm trying to push myself through that feeling. I, I just want to, like, if there's a way to put a big hug around people to say how I got to this spot like it was not um roses and petals and sitting in a classroom it was a lot of pain and suffering that got me to empathy and I think that's why I'm I'm I don't think it's feeling distracted I just feel like I want to um put a big it's okay hug around folks um okay yeah so uh, what I'm hearing is that you're really, uh, you know, appreciating all of the difficulties and all the comparing and all, all the, you know, the bumps in the road that people are experiencing. And what you would like to do is just put a big hug around them because you've shared experiences like that and you came out the other side and you want to show your support. Yeah. Affection. And these ugly experiences are what make you better at doing the work, actually, I think. And that's kind of like right in the frontal lobe for me. And so I, I don't know, it's like my heart's all happy um, because sometimes what feels like being buried is actually being planted. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you're feeling that all these experiences and stuff help you grow and evolve um, and, and, and overcome those um, negative, maybe, uh, you know, self-conceptions. Yeah. And growth hurts. I think that's the only thing I got. Kinda. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Growth, exactly. growth hurts. It. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you, Bill. I feel okay. hurt. Okay. Great. Um, so, Kathy, are you with us now? Yes. Uh, we had uh, uh, six people in the room, and two of them uh, weren't really participating, and one of them had to drop off because he was being called with his office in Dubai, and then another one had to leave early. So it left three of us. So I texted Edwin and Wendy and asked them to put us in other rooms because right. three people is, isn't, you know, as good as having five or six. Right, right. All right. So will you listen to me? Let's get you. Yes, I'm listening. Okay. Um, so one of the things that, you know, again, I'm sort of a student of, um, uh, dysfunctional behavior, uh, such as violence and all sorts of things like that and abuse. Uh, I'll stop there. Yeah. So you're going to tell us something related to uh, you've been a student in your experiences of violence and dysfunctional behavior. Right. And so especially when I went to these demonstrations, we took the empathy tent out. Um, we went and uh, especially with people who um, I do not share a political view with. Uh, we went there to listen. I'll stop there. Yeah. So the empathy tense, you went to listen to people, even though you did not share the same political beliefs. Right. 
And so, um, you know, people would look at me and, you know, they would make assumptions or I would make assumptions, whoever. Um, but when you basically, when somebody speaks and you don't respond, but you reflect and you demonstrate an honest desire to understand what they're feeling, the labels kind of fall away. I'll stop there. So people could easily label you by looking at you and you can easily label others by looking at them. But when you really have a genuine interest in listening and just reflecting what people say, and not expressing your opinions, the uh, those um, uh, judgments fall away. Yeah. And, and then and then the labels fall away and, and then just two individuals, uh, you know, emerge, you know, mm -hmm. we agree with some things. We don't agree with something else. But there you do find some sort of common ground or common experience. So focusing on just listening allows these common experiences to reveal themselves. Right. Um, and there is what I believe that the empathy circle does. It doesn't solve problems, but it creates a ground, kind of a foundation of communication from which then problems can be solved. Mm -hmm. So the empathy circle doesn't solve problems, but it, but it creates a listening and a, and a respect and a judgment-free zone that then allows problems to make solutions to maybe emerge or a willingness to start looking for solutions. Great. Thank you, Kathy. I feel fully heard. Right. Oh. Uh, is there anybody who hasn't had a turn in a while since I'm new to the circle? Lou. 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 Oh, good. Lou, would you be my listener? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I love what Nicole said. I wrote it down. Sometimes when it feels you are being buried, you are actually being planted. Yeah. So Nicole had a memorable comment, which hit home with you. Sometimes when it seems like you're being buried, it's actually something is going to be planted. Yeah. So you're being planted. Flourish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, as she was sharing her experience, I wanted to share that I too have been forged in the fires, many fires. Mm. That um, you, well, I, I get what, I get the metaphor, the refiner's fire. You've come, you're a survivor. I mean, I might venture, this is uh, a word. You, you know, you've come through some, some tough stuff. Maybe even you're a survivor. Yeah, I, I don't look at it as being a survivor. I look at it as being um, having the gift of growing no matter mm -hmm. how it happens. And I, I think it has to happen. You don't grow if there's not difficulty. So you've had you faced challenges and you've come through them. And that has um, been an experience of growth. Yes, for sure. I would not change any of them for the world. And it only it was only in the last maybe 10 years, you know, that I was grateful for those experiences. So it took me a while to be grateful for them. Mm. Gratitude is powerful. And uh, you came through some stuff and you found that on the back end, um, it was enriching in in a number of ways. I mean, um, including a matter of of yeah. gratitude. Well, it developed my heart in a way that um, I'm proud of my heart. Hmm. Well, you've you've got a heart, and and that means I mean, heart is, you know, heart is. It's not. It's empathy. It's feeling. Um, it's in. It's it's made. It's in. It, it's expanded your. That what you've what you've come through has expanded your humanity. How how is that? Yes, yes. And that. um, somebody mentioned this earlier, and I um, uh, uh, started being more gentle with myself when I'm really like uh, burned out because I'm a therapist and I do all kinds of volunteer work. Uh, I'm not at my best, mm. and there's this. I'll stop there. Well, so you, you, you're a contribution, you contribute, you do volunteer work, 
And guess what? It takes its work. Volunteer work is work. And it, it may even be draining. And it leaves you with, a, I don't think you said compassion fatigue, but burnout. I mean, you need to, I mean, you're, you're experiencing draining of emotional resources. Your emotional resources are it's burned out. Less. Say burned out. Yeah. yeah, but okay, yeah. got it. Burned out. Uh, and um, so what I realized is, you know, there's this saying that if you want to know who people are really are, look at them under stress or whatever. There's that saying, something like that, right? But I totally disagree with it. You are not who you are when you are burned out. That is not who you are. So disagreement, productive disagreement here. Um, that on a, ba on a bad day, on a day I'm burned out, this is not who I am as a possibility. I'm, a, you know, I'm some other, you were talking about contribution earlier. I'm the possibility of contribution and burned out. That ain't me, but that's, that's my commitment. Maybe. Yes. But, an extra word, but. You know, that's, that. yeah, that's the reason to be very devoted to not being burned out because it causes you to be somebody you're not. Well, burnout has a cost and an impact, and it's generally not good. Exactly. It's like who I'm not. And yes. uh, so, so, you know, I mean, so that's a, I'm going to say it, maybe that's an issue here. I don't know for you. Well, I'm, I've recently uh, been feeling burned out, but, I've, but I'm getting myself back on track, and I'm going on a two-week personal retreat uh, mid-September, and I can't wait. I'm so excited. So the... You know, I mean, so take a take a beat, take a break, uh, and renew and 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 gather resources and a personal. I mean, retreat means a lot of things, but it means get in touch with what's important and who you are as a possibility, with in a context of yeah. you know, empathy, maybe. <laughs> I feel fully heard. Thank you. All right, my turn. Oh, again, my turn again. At this point, I. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, I'm still comparing. I'm realizing that my life is is full of judgment. Pick listener. Ah, listener. Well, you know, um, uh, uh, any, many, miny, mo. How about Dr. Price? Oh, I get you again, Lou. I'm so excited. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Well, I'm in a pattern, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so let me repeat what I said. I, I seem I'm in a I'm in a pattern of of comparison a couple of people call that out i thank them for that and i realize you know my life is thick with judgment mm. so you are still feeling like you're in a pattern of comparison a couple people have called that out today and you feel like your uh, judgment is the word that you would use to describe where you are right now thank you uh thank you judging and assessing and so here's here's I, this might be a little long, but here's here's what I'm dealing with. Um, at the beginning of the summer, um, I sent out a book proposal. Empathy and literature. Mm. Well, that's short. That is very short. <laughs> you said that uh, here's what you're dealing with. At the beginning of the summer, you sent out a book proposal. Empathy. My, my yeah, empathy. My my wife sitting at dinner. My wife said. In the beginning was the word, empathy. I said, that's it. That's the title. Okay. It's about literature. It's about Marion, I mean, George Eliot, Thomas Mann, um, you know, who's hot? I don't know. Some, you know, it's about stories. Yeah. So you were at the table with your wife and she said, in the beginning was the word and the word was empathy. And you thought, oh, yes, that's the title. And it just reminds you of all these literary geniuses um, on the topic. And it's full of stories related to that. So, uh, you know, 200,000, approximately 200,000 words later, I sent out 50 proposals. I got four responses. Okay. You know, so 250. That's, a, that's the data. We got the data. Um, and and yesterday, I got one of those responses said, this thing is not going forward. And, and I read the four-page review, and 
um, it was so I had it. I had it judgment that it was somewhat insulting. Um, I haven't taken any. <laughs> that's an interpretation. She said, you know, he seems to be academic, but he's not. Uh, and here's here's the thing. She distributed the wrong proposal. <laughs> so I'm vexed. Gotcha. So you sent, um, you wrote about 200,000 words. You sent it to 50 people. You got less than a 10% response. Four people responded to you. Uh, one of those was incredibly critical. Uh, the per Well, I, incredible. It was critical. And uh, it, had, it had things in it like, uh, you seem like an academic, but not said that it's not going anywhere. And she had sent out the wrong proposal. And this is vexing to you. It is vexing because once an editor or a reader takes a position, it is very hard for them to back off of it. Yeah, so once an editor takes a position, it's hard for them to back off of it. And you're concerned about that. Well, that's right. So here's the, you know, so I don't know. So I've been, I've been comparing and judging and evaluating and um, basically being, I had my feelings hurt. Net, mm -hmm. net, I had my feelings hurt. And it puts me in mind of Stevie Ray Vaughan's song, not about publishing. You mess with my woman, you're going to see a guy get mean. I'm feeling mean. It's not about my woman. I have a great relationship. You know. I got it. So you are... Um your feelings are hurt and that causes you to feel um, a, a little bit of a spirit of meanness um, partially because it feels directed towards your wife, even though the two of you have a fantastic relationship. Well, thank you. I mean, I think you got it. This thing goes on forever. I'm going to bring it in for a landing. What has been helpful for me is a gratitude, practicing the skill of gratitude. Um, I did I did see Brene Brown on, on the topic uh, on Netflix again, and it's funny. And, you know, it, it has helped me back away from the ledge. I'm not going to respond. I mean, these are major publishers like Palgrave and, and uh, I don't know, and, and Rutledge and Taylor and Francis. And, uh, you know, and ultimately I can publish it myself should I choose to do so, but that's not the first choice. So I'm going to back off the ledge, be grateful and um, reread my own work. <laughs> you, went to the, you went to the altar of Brene Brown once again, and mm -hmm. we're reminded of the power of gratitude. And that's where you're sitting right now to back away from the ledge. Um, and that's where you're sitting right now. Thank you, Dr. Price. I feel heard. I appreciate you. I feel gotten. And you are the speaker, Dr. Price, and you pick a listener. I am the speaker. Mayor, would you like to be my listener, please? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm trying to think, what am I feeling? What's on top for me right now? Um, you know, I, I've been in the like leadership development space for a really long time. And there are certain things that um, people are open to. Um, topics like how to hardwire accountability into your organization. People are open to those topics. They will bring in every day for those kinds of things. But now that I've had my kind of awakening experience, I know that none of that, none of that stuff works without empathy. And I've also learned that uh, it's hard to be empathetic if you don't give yourself permission to feel the, what I call even the red emotions um, of being hurt or of uh, being depressed or all of those things. And so I, I feel like now that I'm, you know, trying to spark a little more empathy in the world, that it's it feels like pushing a rock up a hill instead of, you know, water flowing. So 
what I got out of what you just said. I'm going to say different words, but I think it'll capture what you're talking about. Let me know if it doesn't. But you were fine in this professional development, doing this and that, and what I would call hard skills, you know, do this and do that, and more action-oriented. And then you have this awakening. And in this awakening, you realize empathy is like fundamental to allow you to feel your own feelings and then to be uh, offering empathy in the world. It comes down to feelings. And then I think that's what I got so far. I feel like there's some yeah. piece missing there. No, you you got it pretty closely. And I, and what I'm often struggling with is I know that before my awakening, I wouldn't have had a lot of patience for an hour and 15 minutes of listening, talking about feelings all the time. And so it's like, how do you, mm. but when, when the accountability thing is not working for years, I mean, people have been disengaged for years. One of the speakers today was talking about how empathy helps drive engagement. You've been disengaged for years. But if we need more empathy in order to drive engagement and drive engagement, and I'm like, I wouldn't have listened to this before. So how do you help people to listen to it? And I think that's what's. Ah, poor little uh, question here for you is how, how to reach out to the people that are like what you were like, H how to do that, how to invite or welcome people listening when they might be not interested or you see them they're checking their watches and on their they're doing the things that you would have done not being open to listen how to invite or welcome or or um show the value and the power of being empathic, even just being empathic with yourself so that you have that sense of <laughs> self-understanding so that you can reach out to these people. Yeah. Um, I think I'll just say that sometimes I feel bad because I know you would have had to trick me before to get me there. Um, <laughs> there's no way I would have gone to an empathy summit on the Saturday before the holiday weekend for hours of which an hour and 15 minutes is purely listened. Like there's no way. So how would you have gotten me there? Mm. Um, and what it took to get me there was this horrific personal experience and this deep, deep seated, horrible emotions to help my awakening happen. And I don't want to give that to people, even if I could. So, so I'm hearing an answer to your question in your question. So what I'm hearing is how to reach out to those people that were like you and that you don't want to offer them this horrible experience so that they would be cracked open, how to do that. And maybe that's the answer is you're not looking to crack people open. You're looking for the people who have been cracked open. Mm sounded like what I heard you coming to and maybe I I was uh assuming something that wasn't there I'm just no I like I like how you reworded it but I'm out of time now Mayor so thank you very oh. much <laughs> okay so Mayor you're the speaker oh yeah. Oh, 10 minutes. Okay. I thought we were coming up. There. You're the speaker and we have time. Mayor. Speaker again? Oh my have, gosh. We have 10 so, minutes. You are allowed to pass. Sometimes there's a lot of pressure to come up with content. Um, wait a minute. What? Oh no. I love speaking. Okay, and I'll try and speak for less than four minutes. Um, well, okay. okay. And my listener, let me choose you, Kathy Kidd. Okay. I'm listening. Okay. I have a challenging situation in my life and it is uh, 
so challenging. I'm going to take this opportunity to say it's beyond discussing in this in three minutes. So what I want to say is the way that I judge myself is challenging, difficult, and even my two jackals, too much and not enough. It's hard for me to listen to them and translate. And I am doing it. So mm, yeah. So you're having a challenging uh, situation in life. It's too hard to talk about in three minutes. And your jackals are like paddling with each other. Um, it's very difficult, it sounds like. Yes. And I my intention is to cosset myself that whatever's going on, I'm still alive. I'm 73 years old. I've managed to stay alive. I didn't think it when I was a child because of traumatic blah, 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 blah. So, hey, I'm alive. I've survived. I've actually done things I'm proud of. Yeah. No matter how challenging this is, you remind yourself that there's many challenging things you survived. So uh, this may be one more of them. Yes, thank you. And giving myself credit that I, I'm not only alive still, I'm actually in a way thriving. I'd like to be thriving more and I am thriving in some ways. Mm -hmm. Didn't manage to just stay alive, you managed to thrive and uh, you're thriving in many ways. Yes, I like having those reflections and I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so Natalie, would you like to be my listener? Sure. Okay. So I'm always, I've never written a book, but always in my mind, I'm writing a book. So um, uh, the chapter on self-empathy, I'm going to use, uh, you have, they have quotes on the top of the, before the chapter starts. I'm going to use uh, the quote with the being buried and being planted. I'm going to put Dr. Nicole Price by it. So I will give you credit for that quote on the chapter on self-empathy. So what I heard you say, Kathy, is that in your mind, you're listening and collecting information and you can see in your mind's eye how that would fit into a manuscript and a published book. And what you're picturing is a quote by Dr. Price. Yes, the chapter on self-empathy. Um, and I'm interested in marrying um, empathy, kindness, humility, and gratitude. And I imagine a book that says all that matters in life is kindness, empathy, humility, and gratitude. So, Kathy, you're imagining a book that has a culmination of concepts that boil up the essence of what's really key and important to life yeah i think that's all uh, i feel fully heard okay we have a few minutes um i'm not quite sure ex exactly uh dr petahoff uh do you have uh, would you like another speaking turn i'm good thank you okay um well, sometimes we do, we have kind of this odd, I think there's three minutes left or two minutes. Any questions or any uh, general discussion before we go back into the big room? Anything, any questions about the process of the training or? Yeah, Mayor. Question, because this is my first time of being in an empathy circle in this particular structure. How? What do you do with all that comes up well, I'll speak for myself. There are so many times I was like, oh, I have an answer to that. Or, oh, I could help with that. Or what What do you do with all that uh, urge to contribute? You can respond in any, when you're, it's your speaking turn. 
um, you could you could respond in any of that. You can you can be as politically incorrect or give advice or or break all the rules in 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 a way when it's your speaking turn. Oh. Um, yeah. Good to know. Yeah, yeah. And I see we have eighteen oh. seconds. Is there any? Okay. Now, Lou, you want to uh, lead us in an interpretive dance, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> That's a great idea. Dance in the chaos. Keep dancing in the chaos. Hey, man. I mean, I love that. you know, I, I'm good with that. I mean. Hello. Great. I think everybody is back. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope your circles went well. Uh, next, uh, Kathy is going to be leading us in a bit of a debrief. And yes. yep. All right. So we can just take 30 seconds each. Uh, how was the circle for you today? Or how was the summit? Or anything else you'd like to share? And I'm going to call on everybody so that we can be uh, go quickly through and hear from everybody. Uh, Dennis? Nigala, would you like to share for 30 seconds or less? Yes, uh, our circle went well. Uh, being that this is my first time, uh, I, for me it was a moment of learning, uh, learning and learning and sharing. So I'm uh, absolutely uh, pleased. Thank you, Dennis. Sandra. This is also my first time and I really appreciate this group and I'm glad to be here and to the point where I want to invite some other people because I think they would also benefit as much. So thanks. Yes, thank you. And Nicole. Uh, yeah, throughout the, the time I've um, been just so excited to just share with people I know all the exciting things I'm learning about and gratitude is my one word. Thank you. Dr. Golda. I, I was moved by the depth and the personal connections uh, that were made to empathy. Mm. Mm -hmm. Natalie? Um, I'm just really thrilled to see the number of people who are focused on this topic and their passion and dedication to really, I guess it gives me hope in a world that I personally feel is a bit upside down. And so I'm just really grateful to, to witness this and to be part of it and to thank you all for your contributions. Thank you. Keep coming back. Bob Brown. So grateful for this gathering and this world I'm in and the chance to make a difference for the better. Thanks. Thank you. Jeanette. I am also grateful for the inspiration and the power of empathy to change our world and for learning. Mm, thanks. Lou, you're, you're muted. Thank you. I am unmuted now. It was a good review uh, for me to be quiet and listen. The challenge I'm facing is the conversation in my head is so loud. My opinion of what you are saying is so forceful that I can't hear what you're saying. So an empathy circle is the antidote to that problem to quiesce the internal conversation. You can't ever really stop it, but set it aside so I can hear you. So thank you for that. I acknowledge you're all listening. You're creating the empathy in that moment. Thank you, Lou. Mary. I found, I found the empathy circle very supportive today and listening to this morning is very inspiring. It touches my soul very strongly. Thanks. Carolyn, oh, you're muted. I am thrilled, I'm moved, I'm excited. 
knowing that there is so much beauty and elegance in the world and my heart is full of happiness. Mm, thank you, I too. love the opportunity to share with all of you today. Thanks. Uh, Mir. Yes. Uh, maybe that's yes is the answer. I uh, Let's see, 30 seconds. Oh, uh, joy is the fuel. And so I'm fueled up and... Uh, Empathy has a path in the middle, which I uh, journeyed with you all today. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, there's a word mudita. Mudita means what goes on in me when I experience the joy going on in you. Mm -hmm. People have scientific ways about neural mirroring or whatever, but just joy. So that's what's alive for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Celia. Uh, yes, for me, it is uh, really uh, wonderful to have practiced this and that I run the circle, circle as well. And also I realize, again, it is part of our communication learning. It's not the whole system. It is a really specific technique to really quiet the mind as uh, Lou said. So, and, but though beautiful that emotional um, feelings uh, that there um, can show up and can, can be hurt. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh um, I am so grateful to be here. Um, this was my first time participating in an empathy circle and empathy, empathy circle training. Um, it's something that I want to incorporate in my life, just with my own personal growth journey and also incorporate in the nonprofit that I work for locally in Santa Barbara. So Edwin, I'm, I'm very excited to, um, participate in a couple of your in-person trainings coming up in the future. So thank you all. Rebecca. Uh, Ariel? Good pass? For Zoom? Uh, good evening. Well, I completed my first training last week and participating this week, I'm uh, I'm really enjoying, and especially when we experience a couple of challenges uh, in the empathy circle, uh, was very valuable. I enjoyed very much meeting new friends um, and excellent time. Thank you, I'll keep continuing. It's uh, my new community now. Thank you. You are Zoo. Lona? Yes, I'm very grateful to sharing this openness together and this deep listening, this trust. And I just can say thank you, special to Larry in the circle he lead us. It's amazing. Thank you, Lona. Ralph? Did you say Ralph? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was a little bit um, envious of those of you who were here for the first time, because it's like your first kiss. But then I realized that I'm a hopeless romantic and it was like my first kiss. It was just so wonderful. Uh, I've been traveling on the other side of the riverbank from, from uh, many of you that I started out with, working with the meditation uh, community. And to me, um, I bring Sangha and listening circles wherever I am. I'm so fully uh, stamped with it. So grateful to you, um, Edwin, and to the developers. Um, you, haven't let, you haven't let go um, of this. And I think it's burning uh, more brightly than ever, more needed than ever. I wish that the summit could be heard by the entire <laughs> empathy uh, community. Uh, broadcast in the halls of Congress. Um, 
And um, this is a very, I've been in very bad pain, but as long as I'm with you, uh, the pain almost disappears in the joy of being here and connected. Thank you, Ralph. Welcome. BJ. I would just like to say absolutely beautiful connection in our circle. Carolyn, Alex, Ruth, Dr. Gola, Ellen did not want it to end. And I love James Baldwin. He says, not everything can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And it was a beautiful circle. We didn't want it to end. Thank you, BJ. Linda? All right, takes me a while. Uh, okay, this morning was fantastic. Um, I just, you know, never thought about empathy. I guess I keep it on a box or something. I don't know. But in terms of the health care and animals, I had never thought about empathy for the animals or whatever, which, you know, really um, was good information. And the circle was great uh, because everybody in there had, had a clue what the circle was about. So the information, uh, the talks, the people speaking, different perspectives and how they can use empathy or how they do use empathy. And um, it was it was good. Very worthwhile. Thank you. Ali? Oh. Okay, there we are. Uh, yeah. Sally, did you want to share for 30 seconds or less? I'm sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that this is like um, experiencing, we all need to grow in such a way that we take our dream through what Edwin has built for us and make it grow in the meaningful ways that we put forth in our life. Sally. Harry. Harry, do you want to wake up? I couldn't quite hear you. Oh, no. yes. Do you want to share for 30 seconds or less what today was for you? Did you say Larry? Yes, Larry. Oh, thank you. Now I hear you. Oh, I am just so glad that empathy, you know, like Lou was saying, is not a rumor in a fairy tale <laughs> in a land far, far away. <laughs> it's alive in each of us. Thank you, Edwin, for your persistence in noticing that. And Carl Rogers, for your persistence in noticing that. And everybody who's allowing empathy to be alive in each of us today, right now. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Jonathan? Uh, well, thank you. I, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm sorry I got a late start today. Um, and I'm struck by uh, how much I enjoyed uh, our empathy circle uh, that we just had the breakout room. Uh, we all were able to communicate, and that was what was important. Thank you. Thank you. I just noticed we had a second page. I want to see, I missed Ruth. Ruth, would you like to share for 30 seconds or less? I'll be honest, thank you. Um, yeah, it's um, the one word that I left the breakout room with was heartwarming. I mean, it truly did. On a physical level, I actually felt my heart warming up in the group. So thank you all for that. Um, Thank you. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Ellen, would you like to take 30 seconds or less? Uh, yes. Thank you so much. I am always happy in these groups. And um, I felt we had really beautiful, heartfelt connection, attention to how we want to problem solve in getting empathy into the world. I just want to say that personal stories are very important. I'd love to be in a, a group that's all personal stories, but we had a nice blend of that and systemic. Empathy is in us. Um, tr and trust, and it it just needs to be freed, safe, and welcome. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, hi from Prague. 
Uh, I would like to thank you for the experience, for the tasting of your circle. And just to state from distance that for me, it's really, it's an organ. It's organ that we can actually train, we can grow, and that gets stronger and stronger by time we give to it and by our attention. So um, that that we could experience a bit of it today. Thank you. Janet? Mm. Janet, would you like to share? Uh, yes, um, it's been eye-opening to see um, all the uh, different approaches uh, that um, people have taken with the core value of the empathy circle and the um, meeting of uh, new and also seeing old uh, friends in, our, in the breakout room. Thanks. Anna? Um, we had a wonderful circle and uh, and I love the presentations and I'm really happy to be here. And what comes to mind for me is the sense of adventure that there's always surprises, you know, and I never know even what I'm going to say. And it's always fresh to hear everyone and to, you don't know who's going to be in the room and what's going to be shared and what will arise. So I really appreciate that um, joy of discovery and adventure. Thank you. Jenna. Bill, would you like to share? Sure. I was, um, as usual, I was really impressed with the openness and honesty that the people in the group in the breakout room came with. And um, it's always for me an antidote to the kind of constant media <laughs> barrage <laughs> that I live under. So yeah. thank you all. Thank you. I think I have gotten everybody except for Edwin. Uh, Ariel, are you ready? Yes, yeah, sorry, okay, I right. expected it before. So um, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been really wonderful to be here. I heard about this at the last minute and work I do combines, I used to train horses and I often talk about how fundamental learning to that nonverbal communication is to the work I do now with mediation and coaching and training people. And I just loved being in a context where that was understood kind of that empathy is part of who we are and includes all beings. Um, and thanks for getting a chance to reconnect with that and be part of a community for that. Yeah, I think that's a good way for me to finish this before I turn, turn it over to Edwin. Empathy is- Oh, sorry. Just there's just one more person. Who there's is it? D video is <laughs> off. So D, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, this is Danielle. Um, unfortunately, I'm in the middle of Ireland, and if I turn on my camera, <laughs> my sound goes. So okay. apologies for that. Um, just what I got today um was so much. I'm so encouraged by all of us who are scattered across the globe today, like gold us coming together to focus on, as Edwin coined the phrase, building a culture of empathy. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the summit today and the presentations were so lively and food for thought. This is my first time to participate in an empathy circle and I value the experience and the opportunity to meaningfully connect with other people today. Um, and as empathy promotes connection, um, it's also the antidote for so many ills within us and within society. So um, it's so ultimately healing. So it's a, a beautiful common denominator for all of us today. So. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. I went over to you. Okay, everyone went. Let me just be yes. sure. Okay. Yeah, right. Then um, where are we at? Uh, so yeah, thank you uh, everyone for taking part in this uh, Empathy Summit. Uh, it's really about building a movement. So we're trying to, uh, we are in the process of building a bigger and bigger movement, getting a snowball going here, so we're learning about empathy, we're practicing it, and we're spreading it uh, around the world. And it's really about bringing people together for everyone to feel heard, seen, and uh, listened to, and for it to be mutual, and create that sense of care that comes out, out of that. So in terms of uh, next steps, I'm going to uh, put into the chat here uh, the, some next steps that we have next week. You can come again. Uh, there'll be another 
uh, 12 or so uh, trainers uh, presenting their trainings uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, there's the, uh, in the background, if you see my background, it's the Empathy Center that we're building in Santa Barbara. There's, uh, we have 35 acres and 55,000 square feet of uh, a property that used to be a Catholic seminary. And it's in the hills overseeing Santa Barbara. And we're creating the Empathy Center Retreat Center. And it's a place for holding these summits, these trainings. And it's, it'll be an open space uh, for uh, all kinds of different uh, positive, constructive uh, workshops. And we do have today, in an hour, we have our regular visioning circle. And uh, we like to be consistent with it. So I'll be do hosting that again if you want to continue holding it, doing some more empathy circles. And uh, that starts in an hour in the same Zoom room that you came to now. And uh, you can practice a little bit more. And you can also learn about the Empathy Center and share your ideas, like how do we develop this center really to, uh, uh, to help spread the word, uh, to be like a beacon, someone mentioned, you know, for, for the world that we can really spread that message of, of mutual listening. And uh, then also the next training, uh, somebody was mentioning they're in Santa Barbara, Sandra, I think there's somebody. Uh, and uh, we have the training in Santa Barbara for facilitator training. So you've seen a lot of people with ECF after their name, they've taken part in the uh, training and uh, that you can uh, actually join an in-person training and then finally, we have, uh, if this final link I'm going to put in there, this is the feedback form. So if you just take a second, I'll just wait for everyone to just click on that link. And that will open the feedback form. And if you just uh, type your email into the email there, just uh, put your email in there. And that'll just get you started on doing the feedback form. So we're going to close in a second here, and you'll be able to fill, you know, keep that form open and fill out that the feedback form. It uh, gives us uh, you know, your email, and it's a way to stay in contact. We can get your feedback about the uh, the event today, any suggestions you have. You can also get involved in the Empathy Summit team. So. We have a team that's working to produce these summits. You can get involved in that. You can actually uh, suggest a topic and lead a, you know, hosting a, a topic because we do hold these every two months. And I think that's about it for this summit. We've gone two minutes over. Really like to keep on time, keep everybody's schedule. And we like to end with our jazz hands. Uh, just a mirrored reflection for everyone. Get those jazz hands up there. <laughs> And uh, we'll see you next week or in an hour if you're wanting to take part. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.